You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm Jordan Pridgen. So Jordan is filling in for Jimmy today. Jordan is one of our writers here at the Command Zone. He's responsible for a bunch of the ads that you see, Mm -hmm. some other cool projects, uh, like the Strixhaven videos, things like that. I I do. We write little side things whenever we can uh, uh, find time for it. Which is hopefully often. Yeah. Uh, But today we are here because Jordan's also a big time commander player, and we are going to be talking about all the monocolored legendaries from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. There is a lot of cool stuff, and I, I would say that... In recent memory, at least, there are more cool monocolored commanders in this set than I can remember in any set, you know, for a while. Yeah, I think there's some really exciting ones, which kind of makes sense because Kamigawa's always been sort of like legendary and stuff. So. Yeah, a lot of interesting design. But before we get into it, we got to talk about our sponsors. Channelfireball.com slash command. That's the place you want to go if you're going to pre-order your Kamigawa Neon Dynasty stuff. If you want to get a bundle, a collector's booster, a set booster, a draft booster, or pre-order any of the singles or anything like that, channelfireball.com slash command is the place to go. It's the best place to get all of your magic products, singles, anything at all. And they have this cool feature where if you forget to put in uh, the affiliate link, which I always forget, yeah. you can just put in the code command at checkout and it will still apply. We really appreciate everybody that supports us in that way. And then of course, once you get the cards, once you get your hands on them, you uh, want to protect them. You don't want anything to happen to them. Ultra Pro, make the products that we trust our own collections too here at the Command Zone. I have all my decks in Eclipse Sleeves. They're in some form of Satin Tower or Mythic Collection or some other Ultra Pro deck box because, you know, cards have value. We don't oh, want yeah. them to get dinged up, you know, so you always want to use a nice Eclipse Sleeve. Also, Ultra Pro makes this stuff that really protects your, you know, your cards really well, but also it looks the coolest. Like nobody makes the products that look as cool as Ultra Pro. That's because they get the the license, the IP from Wizards to be able to use all the actual art. And Neon Dynasty has some of the coolest art we've ever seen oh, as absolutely. well. absolutely. Yeah. So again, supporting by supporting Ultra Pro, you are supporting this podcast and all of our content. And then of course, the final way to support all of our stuff is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You know, Patreons get a lot of perks. They get to hang out and chat with all of us on our Discord every single day. Jimmy and I are on there all the time answering questions, chatting with people. They also recently, we've started doing a thing where we're releasing uh, exclusive Patreon content. In fact, Jordan, you were featured pretty heavily on one of those recently. Yeah, we, we put one out about the, uh, the the bet that we had in the last Extra Turns. We actually went back to the raw footage from that episode of Extra Turns to look at all the stuff that was cut out and then kind of dissect the the high stakes moment, the bet that we made yeah. and you know talk about what happened behind the scenes here. And that is some content that only the Patreons uh, have access to. We are not going to put that on our main channel. So if you want get access to exclusive content support mm-hmm. our uh our channel and also you know get to interact with us and stuff like that patreon.com slash command zone all right let's get into the main topic here it's gonna be a long one because there's a lot of stuff monocolored commander oh oh geez why when jimmy's here i always forget this murph had to remind <laughs> me too yeah uh, patrons also have another perk which is that we shout out one lucky patron every single episode every single episode and this episode is dedicated to walter, walter monterosa walter you rock all right, on to the main topic for real. <laughs> the monocolored commander review for K- Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. We're going to be covering all the monocolored commanders from both the main set and the commander product. Yep. Uh, I'm going to make an uh, advance apology about uh, pronunciation. We're going to do our best here, but obviously, you know, we may mess some things up. So we apologize. Yes. Uh, nothing that we say wrong is like an active choice that we made or anything. <laughs> yeah. Probably we'll just say it like five different ways. And yes. hope we got our basis covered, but yeah. Okay. Let's start out. There were a number of uh, cycles in this. In fact, there are three different legendary monocolored legendary creature cycles in neon dynasty. So we're going to go through all of them. Some a little slower than others. The first is the spirit dragon or dragon spirit cycle. In the old days, we remember Kokusho. Yeah. Uh, which still gets a lot of play. Yeah, Kokushu is, you know, was banned for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Kega, there's a, you know, there's that cycle that's pretty famous yeah, exactly. in commander circles. And so this is kind of the the new, you know, spirit dragons from Kamigawa. And I think these are all supposed to be like the ancestors of the previous oh, dragons. Oh, is that what it stuff? is? Oh, yeah, because yeah. we're like 1,200 years in the future or yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's a long time. That makes sense. Um, one of the interesting things is those dragons from old Kamigawa are famously, they all have uh, dies triggers. Yep. So they don't do anything when they enter, they do something when they die. Mm-hmm. These spirit dragons also have dies triggers, but they've taken a step beyond that, and all of them are modal 
dies trigger. So you have a choice between two different triggers whenever one of these dies. Yeah, which, which seems like kind of fun and versatile. I, I like it. I like a lot of them. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. We're going to look at each of them to see, I think, when the two uh, modes kind of line up is when they're a little stronger w than when they're, they're doing totally different things because then you just build are building a different deck based on which uh, trigger you're going to go with. So let's start sure. with the first one. It's the mono white one. It's Ao. Uh, Ao. Ao. I assumed it was Ao. Ao. Ao, the dawn sky. Uh, really cool art. Three white white for a five four legendary creature dragon spirit mm -hmm. has flying and vigilance. When Ao dies, choose one. Look at the top seven cards of your library. Put any number of non-land permanent cards with total mana, mana value four or less from among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. And then the second choice, if you don't do that one, is put two one one counters on each permanent you control. That's a creature or vehicle. I feel like one of these is, is a slightly more powerful skill than the other. Yeah, adding counters to everything. We've seen a lot of cards that do that. Sure. The first ability is kind of like Collected Company almost, which is a very powerful card. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is, seems like it's a little less powerful than that sort of thing because it really can only hit a maximum of four CMC. And I think that's, that is probably going to inform how you build around this deck and that sort of thing. But still, if it dies and you get two or three things, that's a powerful effect. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. And you get the choice, right? If you, yeah. you look at seven and then you can sort of choose the best stuff at that time. Sure. Uh, so, okay. All of the dragons have two dies triggers. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be certain things that are kind of good with all of them. We're going to go through them here for AO, but you can kind of apply some of this stuff to all of them. Then we'll talk about AO specifically. Yeah. I just Assume wanted to have that... one of these dragons up while we're discussing these things. Yeah, exactly. Assume that we just say all of these for all of them. <laughs> okay. So sacrifice effects are always going to be good, right? You've got dies triggers. You want your dragons to die. You want to control at which point they're dying so that you can get that trigger when you want it. And you probably want to get a little bit of value out of them dying too, or yeah. a little extra. So astronauts altar, high market, that kind of stuff. Yep. Everybody knows what sack effects are if they watch the show by now. Uh, trigger duplicators are all going to be good. Strionic resonator, lithothe the form engine. Uh, those are just going to uh, allow you to double up the trigger when it happens if you have the mana. Yeah. Obviously going to be good. Uh, clone effects are going to be pretty good with all of these dragons because of the legendary rule. When you clone one of these, you will have to sacrifice one of them. You're not allowed to have two of the same legendary creature. And then when you do sacrifice, eh, probably you're sacrificing the commander because it goes back to the command zone. I don't know. Depending on which, whatever reason you have for sacrificing whichever one you sacrifice, you'll get the dice trigger. We have Blade of Selves kind of listed on here. Right. And think about how Blade of Selves work. Uh, you just attack with him. You get three extra or two, two extra. extra of him you just let both of those die and you get two of the death triggers and that's very powerful yeah so that's that's pretty awesome because of the myriad mimic yeah. vat's another one that's colorless so it could go on all these decks mimic vat's cool yeah, yeah you could just kind of have a new one to come out whenever you want it really yep graveyard recursion will be good with all of these i mean Obviously, the rule has changed recently, so if a legendary dragon, legendary creature dies, your, your commander dies, sorry, goes to the graveyard, you can choose to put it in the command zone, but that's going to be inefficient because you'll have to then pay commander tax. Yeah. So obviously, if you have ways to just recur it straight out of the graveyard, that's going to be better. There are a number of sort of colorless ways to do this that could go in all the, any of these dragon decks. Uh, Lifeline's a good one. Nim Deathmantle, we'll probably talk about quite a bit, but that's a good one. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, if you have a sack outlet, most of these will be very good or just win on the spot if you ever create infinite infinite mana ship yep. because what you can do is just cast it sack it get the trigger cast it sack it get the trigger for instance ao will kind of get all of your four cmc or less stuff onto the battlefield if you just do that right sure and you put all your like low mana stuff out and then suddenly you can start switching to the other side of it and pump everything up and you've got a board that can just win the game yeah if one of those things gives you haste somehow or a couple of things sure you wouldn't even need haste on everything maybe because if some people are low enough you're just like Assuming you have a lightning reserve or swift foot boots, you get it on something, and uh -huh. you know that could often win you the game. I'd say some of these other ones will more clearly just win you the game if you ever go infinite on a mana. Right. Okay. So that's the stuff that's going to be good with all the dragons. Let's talk about AO specifically. Pretty interesting card. The two modes are not like completely related, but they're a little related. It's it, it, it sort of to me it seems like it's kind of trying to bring like a white weenie sort of strategy to commander a little bit, which you know white has always been very good at for a yeah. while, and now it's 
giving you a pretty powerful body to kind of do that with. Yeah, mono whites had a problem doing the, they usually do tokens because white weenie strategy is usually like playing low to the ground cards that are like small creatures themselves. Yeah. And the card advantage is necessary to kind of get to the number that could win a commander game. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe going to allow something like that to happen. So yeah, low mana value tribal. Um, the first ability, which again, you look at the top seven cards and then you pick from among them a total of four mana value spread out between as many cards as you want, put it onto the battlefield. And they're, it's non-lands, can't be lands. Right. Um, so this first ability makes you want, you know, most of your deck, probably all of your deck if possible to be four CMC or less. Yeah. So we're looking at, but all those cards are good that are four CMC or yeah. less, right? There's a lot of great things now, like Esper Sentinel and Land Tax yep. just like come to mind right off the bat. Just staples, uh, Sarah Ascendant, mm -hmm. a card that in the early days of Commander, people used to grumble, it should be banned or whatnot, and it's yeah. kind of like gone away. Like people don't worry about it as much sense, but very right. good in this deck because eventually you pump it up and it gets super big. Mana Rocks. Obviously, it can be cheated out. Things like Mishra's Bobble, Lotus, Lotus Bloom, Mox Amber, especially ones that cost zero. Yeah, zero cost stuff is awesome because if you reveal the top seven cards and two of them cost zero, you're just putting those out and they don't count towards your four. It's just a freebie. Yeah, so as much zero stuff as you could really get in, that's that's good. I don't think you should put like sure. the, like Cathar Shield or whatever. Is yeah. that a card? There's I know there's a shield card that costs zero and it's pretty bad. You don't want random ornithopters just for... Just they might, you because you might... Because. Sometimes you might draw it and then you're like, crap, sure. I, I wasted that draw. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of a lot of zero mana cost stuff is going to be real good. You're going to want top deck manipulation maybe in this deck just mm -hmm. so you know what's there or can possibly like seed what's there. So scroll rack lets you take cards from your hand. Let's say you had a couple zero cost things. Yeah. You put them on top of your library, draw a couple cards in their place, and that's like a pretty big game changer yeah, right there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So and just, of course, the always good Sensei's Divining Top. Which we're going to talk about a lot this episode because <laughs> yeah. it's good with a lot of cards. Unfortunately, very expensive card now because I haven't reprinted it since like Eternal Masters. So there's a card we need reprinted, Wizards. Crystal Ball is another one which is just allows you to sort of tap it and scry too. Just kind of scry in general is, is going to be good with this. Because you can look and be like, well, at least I can get rid of the lands that are here. Yeah. Or maybe something, you know, if something's 4CMC or or maybe your deck has a couple of five plus things and you're uh -huh. just like, ah, I'm, gonna, I'm about to sack uh, AO, so I don't want to have anything high CMC there. I can just get rid of it. So, you know, just a little bit of scry might be helpful. I thought sure. you might even want something like Heliod's Hall of Generosity, which is a land that allows you to take um, enchantments from your graveyard and put them on top of your library. Oh, yeah. And then you could like make sure that they're always there when the thing dies and just have it set up for if that. you have enough enchantments you know obviously we're just sort of theory crafting here you right. i think you would have to look at the list and if you've got you know 12 to 15 plus enchantments you might think because it's a land so it doesn't yeah. cost you a big slot in your deck so that's pretty cool and then let's talk about the second ability from ao how we might take advantage of that and i think White Weenie might be the way to go, but you might even be able to just build around the second ability and sure. you'll get some value out of the first incidentally, but you're mostly going to use it to pump up your uh, creatures when it's time. And that right. could kind of be a, a situation where, because I think in the in what we just talked about, low mana value tribal, top deck manipulation, you're going to try to sacrifice ale a number of times throughout the game, uh -huh. which means you got to put in some recursion, some other hoops to jump through. You're pretty much always going to want that. Well, I, I think you could build it where it's sort of like a token go wide strategy and your plan is to, to Play and sack AO only twice in the game. Yeah, just when you need that final, like, punch. Yeah, it's your pump spell, kind right. of, your finisher. Uh, so you, you might want a bunch of token generators in that build. So, you know, t you you really want a lot of creatures to yeah. put... put to put stuff on. You could put some vehicles in there too, but most vehicles are not that great. Um, so I think you're probably playing token generators like Oketra's Monument, Hazda, Marshall's a good one. You want low CMC stuff like you said because you yeah. want to get as many of them out. If You're probably early in the game if it's early. You still want to use the front side potentially. And, and if you do use the front side, you still probably want to hit something. Yeah, that first ability. Luminarch Ascension seems yeah, really Luminarch good. Yeah, Luminarch Ascension Two is CMC. an amazing card. Yeah, sort of cheated out. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, because I think you still want all your token generators and stuff to be on yeah. low CMC permanence. Or you don't want to like, play... Like Legion's Landing would be kind of nice. That yeah, also, that's a really good one. Yeah. I don't think you want to play like Raise the Alarm, Secure the Waste, because you can't hit those off of AO's first ability. Yeah, you want you want permanence to kind of handle it for you. And then uh, you'll want Counter Synergy if you're leaning into that. So you've got things like the Ozolith, 
Uh, Basri's Lieutenant is really, really good. Uh-huh. That I'll read that one because I don't think a lot of people will play it right now. It's Therena White for a 3-4 human knight with vigilant and protect- Vigilance and Protection from Multicolored. When it enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. And then whenever Basri's Lieutenant or another creature you control dies, if it had a 1-1 counter on it, create a 2-2 White Knight creature token with Vigilance. That's pretty powerful. And um, you could, yeah, you could even keep uh, AO around... If you had a sack outlet and you're not ready to do the thing yet, but somebody goes to board wipe, you go, okay, fine. In response, I'll sack AO. Yep. Everything gets 1-1 one, one counters, and now my board all turns into 2-2 two, two knights, and I kind of get to keep it. Yep. Uh, another great one we kind of mentioned here is Together Forever, mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of interesting because if you have a couple other ways to put counters on things, it can be a good way to like actually get uh, AO back into your hand uh, because... It is when Together Forever enters the battlefield, you support two, which means you put a 1 1 counter on each of up to two target creatures. And then you pay one and choose target creature with a counter on it. And when that creature dies this turn, you return the card to its owner's hand. So this is like great in anything that's a token deck, especially like if it's a mono white deck and you just want to basically get more value out of your creatures. If someone wipes your board, you don't want to just like. Half nothing. Right, you get some of them back to your hand. Together Forever is an enchantment that costs two, so you can easily get it off AO. Yep. Yeah, and I think, like, it can support onto AO Uh when it comes in and give you the ability to get AO back to your hand when you sack it that first time, which could be big game, because now you can maybe sack it, play it, sack it. That's four counters on everything. Maybe, you know, four... Plus four, plus four, and everything will often win the game if you have a decent board. That's a lot. Yeah. White also just has pretty good recursion. So I think white's one of the colors that... Obviously, black's going to be good, but I think white's probably the second best color at, like, you're going to be able to sack AO and reliably be able to get it back. So Gift of Immortality seems amazing. Like it's, one of the best, really. Yeah. So it's an enchant creature. When enchanted creature dies, return the card to the battlefield under its owner's control. So it... Oh, sorry. And then return Gift of Immortality to the battlefield attached to that creature at the beginning of the next end step. So if you sack AO, it comes back. Mm -hmm. And then at your end step, Gift of Immortality comes back attached to AO. And then on the next, right before the end step, you sack AO again. And then the Gift of Immortality. So they really need two removal spells. Obviously, you need a sack outlet so they don't exile or something like that. Or they can obviously remove the Gift of Immortality. But I mean, Gift of Immortality plus a board, just like if you are sacrificing it on every turn when it gets back to you and... Everything has just gotten enormous. I think, yeah. That's or if you don't have a board, it'll make the board with AO's first ability. Exactly. <laughs> and then you sack it to grow the board once it's big enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Angelic Renewal is another one. You want to read that one? Angelic Renewal. Whenever a creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you may sacrifice Angelic Renewal. If you do, return that card to the battlefield. And it's a one in a white enchantment. We got to teach uh, Jordan to read the Oh, right. I got to do is. that part. <laughs> um, so yeah. So two CMC, you just, you know, use that to bring AO right back when it dies. Yep. Uh, brought back, speaking of bringing things back, this is a card I play in a lot of white decks, and if you have a bunch of fetches, um, off-color fetches, if you don't care about the the sort of Vorthosy uh-huh. uh, no-no <laughs> of that, brought back is white-white for an instant. Choose up to two target permanent cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Return them to the battlefield tapped. So one thing I like, I think brought back's really good and even better in this deck because one thing I like to do is sack two fetch lands, go get two yep. untapped lands. Uh, that's why you can play off-color fetches. Mm-hmm. And then use the two white to bring back the two fetch lands onto the battlefield. So it's almost like uh, explosive vegetation for two yeah. mana in that in that uh, instance. But later in the game, you can use it on IO, uh, AO, sorry, and bring it back when you sack it on purpose. And maybe a fetch line two or something else that you sack. Yeah, it's a very versatile card. And I think white has a couple other examples of this like more instant speed uh, revival sort of effect, which we won't list. But I mean, if you look at like other decks that do that sort of thing, yep. you can kind of like find them. One thing about the recursion aspect that I want to say, because we won't go super deep on all of the dragons, uh, all the old dragons from original Kamigawa are monocolored and had a dies trigger. So if you go on edhrec.com, yeah. There will be significant, you know, cards in the deck that are dedicated to the recursion part because they had to jump through the same hoops for uh, Yosei was the one from the last set Uh or last set from the really old Kamigawa set that, you know, they've already figured out what the good recursion was for that deck. So you can just sort of, you know, you you can copy off their work a little bit. Yep. Okay. Let's. um, Oh, sorry. I had a warning here for AO which is focus on only one strategy. So we talked about a lot of stuff. You're not going to be able to pull off everything we talked about in any singular deck because if you try to do too many things, the deck is just going to do nothing. So, you know, pick a lane. Do you want to go tokens, go wide? Do you want to go low mana value tribal? Do you want, you know, what are you going to do the most of? And then, you know, 
commit to it. Because there's a lot of powerful things you can do in each of these. But if you just, like, it's not like some where you can just throw in everything that's good stuff that works in it. You need to have a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Think about play patterns, things like that. Stick to one plan. Don't try and do everything. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about the next one, which is the Mono Red Dragon. At Sushi. Yep. The Blazing Sky, I believe it's called. And this is uh, two red red for a legendary creature, Dragon Spirit. See, I, I read the uh, Good job. CMT Good job. this time. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, this is flying and tr it is a 4-4 four -four with flying and trample. And when at Sushi, the Blazing Sky dies, choose one. Exile up to... T Exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards or create three treasure tokens. So, All right, so one is impulsive draw, and it's until your next turn, which yep. is nice. And the other is ramp, is ramp, is yep. treasure, treasure, treasure. It's a commander with ramp and card draw on it. Is so. ramp and card draw good on a commander? It might be, it might be. That was a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be generically powerful, I think. Uh, one of the cool things about red is they make those, they're, they're the color that makes a token copy of a creature, give it haste, sacrifice it in some some way at end of turn yeah so all those work pretty well to get you a trig uh, a trigger from atsushi well because you don't even need to wait till the end of turn from the sacrifice i mean you would have to because the legendary world sacrifice it right then they but that's fine you're away. just trying to get the trigger yeah so yep. you've got stuff like twin flame splinter, splinter twin. twin splinter twin we have a, not, a lot of new listeners to our show and splinter twin is an our card that we've talked about a lot in recent years so i'll read it Two red red for an enchantment or an enchant creature. Enchanted creature has. Tap it. Put a token that's a copy of this creature onto the battlefield. That token has haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. Now you might be saying, hey, it says exile it. Well, what happens is if you put this onto Atsushi, you tap Atsushi, you make a co token copy of Atsushi, and it says, hey, legendary rule, you can't have two of those. And you go, I'm going to sack the token copy. Yep. And in that case, you're sacking it to the legendary rule, which means it will die. It is a token, but it will still hit the graveyard and trigger dies effects before sort of poofing out of existence. Um, so that's a really good way to get a trigger every single turn uh, on Atsushi. So... I, I put a, a, a category here called return on investment, and that is because Atsushi makes treasure. And there's just been so much treasure support recently. So and it's usually in red. Yeah. Yeah. And so red really has all the tool, tools to make treasure just bonkers good. Like uh, Zorn, which just, uh, I think it's just whenever you'd make a treasure, you make two treasures. Well, instead. whenever you'd create one or more, right. you get one more. So it's kind of like hardened uh, scales. Yeah. But instead of for counters, it's for treasures. Right. So so an Atsushi now dies, you get four treasure. Yeah. And then there's Goldspan Dragon, which has been showing up all over the place, which Very is... Very good. It's a creature for three red red. It's a four four flying haste. And it just, whenever... Well, okay, whenever it attacks or becomes the target of a spell, you create a treasure token. But you don't even really need that in this case because... You I mean, you'll take your it. Own. Yeah. And then treasures you control have tap, sacrifice this artifact, add two mana of any one color. So it doubles the effectiveness of your treasures and can also sort of slowly make treasures. That means when you sack at sushi, you get six mana worth of treasures rather yeah. than three mana worth of treasures, which is big game. If you had Zorn out, now all of a sudden mm -hmm. it, it's getting a little bit crazy. And then, of course, there is Academy Manufacter, which is a three mana artifact creature. Uh, for, it's a 1-3. If you would create a clue, food, or treasure, instead create one of each. So that's just added value. You get clues, some card draw, some stuff in there. Yeah. Good return on investment on your treasures. There is some combo potential with that sushi. Uh, so if you get Nim Death Mantle, two mana for an artifact equipment, it says equip creature gets plus two, plus two, has intimidate, and is a black zombie. That doesn't matter that much. Yeah. But whenever a non-token creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you may pay four. If you do, return that card to the battlefield and attach Nim Death Mantle to it. And Nim Death, Death Mantle has an equip cost of four. So if you got Nim Death Mantle out and you can make f at least five mana by sacrificing at sushi which you already almost do i mean he makes three right off right. the bat so there's so. three uh then you will be up on mana every time you do the min, de min death mantle thing mm -hmm. so let's imagine you have gold span dragon out yep. well that's just automatically going to do it right so you sack at sushi you make uh six treasures and then you use two of Sorry, you don't make six treasures. You make three treasures, but they all sacrifice for two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you sacrifice two of them. That's four mana. 
to pay the Nim Death Mantle brings that sushi back, but you still have that one treasure left. Yeah. So now you go, oh, I'll sack at sushi again. You have to have an Ashnods or something that's a free sack outlet sure. to do this. I'll make do the same thing. And every time you're up one treasure, which means you've now just created an infinite loop and infinite mana. And well, now... And Ashnods, I think, just kind of does it on its own because Ashnods oh, creates yeah. the two mana and then it creates three treasures. That's a good point. And you're up to five. If you already had Ashnods, yeah. three treasures plus the two mana from Ashnods will do the Nim Death Mantle thing by itself. So, and then we've already sort of... Um, establish that if you have infinite mana with one of these dragons now you just say okay i do that a million times i have a million treasure mm -hmm. sitting here and now i'm just going to do the first mode which is exile the top two cards in my library yeah. until i've exiled my entire library and they'll just find my comet storm or you know whatever any of a million cards that will just kill everyone on the spot right sure yeah yeah so that's pretty cool. I uh, so We wanted to mention that Atsushi is also good in the 99 of a bunch of decks. Yeah, a lot of them. So Prosper, very good, obviously, because it's exiling cards. And, and it cares about, about that, yeah. Kenrith has the four and a black put target creature from your graveyard onto the battlefield under its owner's control. Yep. So if you... You can get some combos going because that pays the the three treasure play for th three of that five mana cost. Mm -hmm. So there's a way to sort of go infinite there. Uh, Hoffrey Ghost Forge. Yeah, this is kind of a cool one. Yeah, you want to just Hoffrey is a yeah. five mana four five legendary creature. You want to read that second ability? Yeah. So Hoffrey's second ability is whenever another non token creature you control dies, exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a spirit in addition to its other types and has when this creature leaves the battlefield, return the exiled card to your graveyard. So every time something dies, you make a token copy of it, which you can then sack. And then when you sack the token copy, the original copy will come back to the graveyard and you could sort of recur it in some way. So being able to sack uh, Atsushi twice will make six mana. Yep. And I'm sure there's loops you can get into yeah. there. Yeah. Or and you then if just you have other ways to like bring it from your graveyard or something like that, that's just an easy way to get a bunch of it. Also uh, seems really good in uh, Magda, who cares about treasures and dragons. <laughs> so oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so that seems quite good. Actually, kind of forgot the dragon part. Yeah, cares about treasures. Oh wait, <laughs> either this is going in the Magda deck or Magda is going in the Atsushi deck. But yep, they are good friends. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the next one, which is Mono Black. Mm. It's Junji, the Midnight Sky, three black black for a five five uh, legendary dragon spirit. You guessed it with right. flying and Menace. Menace. When Junji dies, choose one. Each opponent discards two cards and loses two life. Or put target non-dragon creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose two life. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. It is obviously related in the way that, like, you sack it for the first ability. Hopefully, they discard some sort of creature card. Of course, they can see your commander, so they're probably not. They're not going to be surprised. Yeah, they're not like, oh, dang, I didn't, I, I didn't think of this. I probably should have discarded my sepulchral primordial or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. But still, uh, they're at least related in that you're sort of filling up some graveyards in some way with that, and then you can, you know, ostensibly uh, reincarnate. What is it? Reanimate? Yeah. from the graveyard, one of those creature cards later because you can reanimate. From from any graveyard, which is a powerful effect. The discard part is kind of a known quantity, right? We've got a lot of decks that are kind of discard synergy. Yep. Uh, so Tiny Bones. It, it, basically, if you go on any deck and you just look up Tiny Bones, like most of those cards will be good cards to put in the Junji deck if you're leaning toward the discard part. Waste Not, Geth's Grimoire. Uh -huh. We're not going to read those cards, but you can look up look them up if you want to. Um, you're going to want to fill graveyards, I think, in a different way if you're going with the second ability. Yep. You can't rely on the discard, again, because they can see Junji. So, like, remember, it can grab any non-dragon from any graveyard. So, yeah, what are some of our self-mill cards? So, like, Stitcher Supplier is just a really powerful one. Um, Minewreck Harpy, Ghoul Caller's Bell. Um, for just as an example, like, Stitcher Supplier is just a, a one-mana creature zombie. It's just a 1-1. One, one. But when Stitcher Supplier enters the battlefield or dies, you put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. So, it's just a very clean, easy way to just... Put a bunch of cards sets. in your graveyard. Yeah, remember, you can choose your own graveyard for Junji, and probably you want to have some big creatures to put it in your graveyard, just in case you're playing against non-creature decks or decks that don't have anything big and impactful. If your plan is for this to be a reanimator deck, like, you don't want to rely on the other people having something to uh, put down. Yeah, you want some of your own stuff in there. Yep. Uh, then, obviously, so some of that stuff might be something like Grey Merchant, always good when you can recur it multiple times yeah. in a game. Sepulchral Primordial, which I already talked about. Hey, I'll regrow my Sepulchral Primordial and then get something from each of your graveyard which so is pretty fun good. yeah <laughs> uh just big stuff like void winner would be you know big and mean to cheat out yeah. early yeah obviously black is one of the reanimation colors and probably the best one yeah so there's 
combo-y type stuff you can do, I'm sure, with the reanimation stuff. Well, and you can also just support it with other reanimation spells and everything yep. like that, which is nice. There is some combo, though. If you use the card Conspiracy, Conspiracy is an enchantment. It's five mana, but it says, as Conspiracy comes into play, choose a creature type. Creature cards you own that aren't in play, creature spells you control, and creatures you control are the chosen type. And it doesn't say in addition to their other types. So it just changes everything you have in play and not in play into, I don't know, merfolk. Whatever yeah. it is that you choose. And this would allow Junji to then reanimate itself. Because it's in the graveyard and it sees itself in the graveyard as a non-dragon creature. Yep. And then it can just reanimate itself. Yeah, so this is a way to just sort of be like, okay, I sack Junji... It goes to the graveyard, trigger on the stack. I'm going to target Junji, bring it back. Now, you lose two life every time you do this, but if you had another thing creating a trigger, this is going to, like, grave pact. Everyone would have to sack however sure. many creatures they've got. And yes, maybe you have to pay six or eight life. Uh, Liliana, Dreadhorde, General, this would allow you to draw cards each time you're doing that. Or I guess there's a suite of cards that if you got a couple of them, you could even out the two life and just kill everybody. So Blood Artist, Bastion of Remembrance, Zulaport Cutthroat. Yep. That makes it so you, if you have two of those, because each time they drain for one, uh, so you gain one, everybody loses one, or Blood Artist is just a target opponent loses one. But still, Sack Junji, trigger, trigger, everybody loses a life, uh, two life, I gain two life, and now I'm even on the two life, just do that again with Conspiracy out, and that's going to kill everybody on the spot. And of course, if you just throw some regular Sack Outlet, you could just kill yourself with it. If you wanted to. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's for an fun. option. That's a Jimmy thing. He would probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Junji looks you know, pretty powerful if you do that. All right, we got two of these dragons left. You want to read the next one? Yeah, so the next is um, uh, Kyrie, Kyrie, the Swirling Sky. And uh, a, this is four and two blue. And it is, again, a legendary creature, Dragon Spirit. And it has flying and ward three on a 6-6 six, six body. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Yeah, it's ward like three. A, ward three is like pretty... Pretty easy. legit, yeah. Yeah. Um, and when Kyrie the Swirling Sky dies, choose one. Return any number of target non-land permanents with total mana value six or less to their owner's hands. Or mill six cards. Then return up to two instants and or sorcery cards from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, so you bounce up to six things. Right. If and some all of them can be yours. value. Yeah, I guess so. And some of them can be yours. Sure. Yep. And then, or you mill six and then return two spells, instants or sorceries, from your graveyard to your hand. And those don't have to be among the six you milled. They could just already been in there. Yeah. I, I wonder if there's some significance to the number six in this card because it's it's all over the place. But... Oh, it's got the mark of the beast. Six, yeah, six, it costs six. six it, but it's not ward six. It's ward three. Yeah. Well, they were like, be... well, that's broken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So blue is the clone color, which means it's... Uh, blue has an easier time getting this trigger than most colors. Yeah. Because imagine phantasmal image. That's a really good one because two mana. Yep. Play it, sack it, get the trigger. Quasi duplicate and c cackling counterpart are actually extremely powerful because they are instants and or sorceries. So you cast them copying your commander and they're in the graveyard to be gotten back with an instant or sorcery. So if you have a quasi duplicate or a ca cackling counterpart, you get one of those back plus whatever spell you really want back. And now you can cast them again or cast this, you know, let's, I don't know what the spell is. We're going to talk about this in a second. Um, but let's just say it was like a brainstorm or something, sure. right? You go brainstorm, draw the three cards, pick the best one, put it down. Now, cackling counterpart, uh -huh. get the brainstorm and the cackling counterpart back. And now I'm just where I was before. I yeah. can brainstorm again, then cackling counterpart again. That is a really, it's not exactly infinite, but it's just like a constant way to generate value, to pull things back. Yeah. If you had infinite mana, obviously you could do it, but then I, I guess you could just bounce everybody's everything and still win that way. Sure. And cackling counterpart specifically is an instant, and there's a couple instant versions of this, which uh -huh. can also serve to like save your commander when somebody targets it with removal if they pay the ward, you know, cost and everything. So those those clones seem very powerful to me. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of them, so that seems like that could be like a really powerful way to build this commander. In fact, there are ways, so let's talk about combo potential yep. with using that thing we just talked about to sort of go infinite. So Turnabout is a card. It's two blue blue for an instant. Choose either artifact, creature, or land. Tap all untap permanents of the chosen type target player controls or untap all tap permanents of that type that player controls. You choose yourself, you say land. Yep. So you go, let's say you have eight lands. Tap eight lands, use four of that mana on turnabout, untap your eight lands. Uh -huh. I'm floating four mana. Yep. Cackling counterpart, Kyrie. To make the copy. To make the copy. Legend rule, sack it. Choose the second ability, get 
two instant standard sorceries yep. back. Choose the turnabout and the cackling counterpart. Uh huh. Mana. They just keep doing that. Yeah. And once you have infinite mana, you can stop doing the turnabout and eventually get like I don't know. You can win pretty easily with like a stroke of genius or something like that. Drive everybody out or yep. any mill mill card that will mill somebody for two or three would just mill them out. Things uh -huh. like that. Yeah. Uh, so that's a pretty powerful. And not that difficult to pull off. And you could also do it with, like, Dramatic Reversal, maybe. Dramatic Reversal, like a notorious combo card. Uh, but you, works yeah, really usually well with for this Ice sort of thing. Yeah, usually with Isochron Scepter. But if you just had a lot of mana rocks, you could just do it. Because it untaps all non-land permanents. You yep. could probably do it with the card Reset. You have to do it on another player's turn. Uh -huh. But that's a card that would do a similar thing. Um, maybe you combine it with, like, High Tide in some way to do that even earlier than when you sure. have eight hands. That could let you, like, have one big crazy turn where you do something like that. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, that that seems pretty crazy. Uh, let's talk about bounce targets. I think, you know, obviously you can and should bounce your opponent's stuff, but you can also bounce your own stuff. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of great ways to, you know, take advantage of that. There are whole decks built around bouncing uh, your stuff, and especially things like Archaeomancer, yep. which could have another thing to bring more instants and sorceries back from your graveyard, you're probably going to want a bunch because when you hit those six, you want more into your thing. So that'll help. Mnemonic Wall, the same yep. kind of thing. Snapcaster Mage. These are stuff that are synergizing with the other ability, which is instants and sorceries being in your graveyard. Uh, and then, of course, I think the the most obvious, most annoying, most whatever uh -huh. ad adjective you want to put on it, uh, extra turns are going to be very powerful with Kyrie because it's a really easy way to be like, Okay, sack it, get the extra turn spell back from my graveyard. You need yep. the ones, you need the extra turn spells like Time Warp, Time Stretch, Temporal Manipulation, the ones that don't exile themselves or shuffle back in after you cast them. Yeah. Yeah, or even just, you don't usually need infinite, like four turns will generally almost always do it. Sure. And because of commander tax, it might get to the point where you can't like recast Kyrie, but sure. getting two back is usually like enough once you've got enough mana. So this is going to be almost certainly, I think, the strongest of the uh, Dragon Spirit bunch. Uh huh. Just because mono blue, just in general, that shell is very powerful anyway. Yeah, th that's just like uh, also, and I mean, it'd be kind of boring, but like you could very easily set this up with like a combo to do like a thoracle kind of thing. Oh, right. Because the first thing mills too. So I was yep. saying you stroke of genius everybody out, but actually probably what you do is just get infinite mana, sack it and mill yourself yeah. all the way. If you find a way to so do get, like the Nim's death mantle thing, like we were yeah. talking about with the other ones. So you can just sack it infinitely. Eventually everything's in your graveyard and then you use a lab man or a Thassa's Oracle or Jace. You probably in, uh, include the card Recall in the deck then, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, a sorcery. It's blue XX, and you choose and discard X cards from your hand to take X cards from your graveyard and put them into your hand, and then you exile Recall. Yeah. So now you can just mill your entire deck then you go, oh, my entire deck's in there. Now I sack Kyrie to get Instant and Sorceries back. I get the Recall back. Now I cast the Recall with my infinite mana to get the Thassa's Oracle back, yep. play it, blah, blah, blah. Boom. I mean, nobody's ever seen that happen in Commander before, <laughs> huh? That's not, that's not a win that we see quite often. Yes, yet another good Thoracle Commander. We mm -hmm. broke it. Congratulations. Okay, uh, one more. It's the Mono Green Dragon Spirit. It's Kura. Kura. You kind of have to roll the Ds, right? Kura, the Boundless Sky. I can't really do it's that, like, but... <laughs> it's like... Nodi, not Nori. Uh-huh. Right? Nodi's really good, by the way. Okay. Just eat it straight when I was a kid. Sure. Three green green for a 4-4 <laughs> four, four dragon spirit flying and death touch. When Kura dies, choose one. Search your library for up to three land cards. Reveal them. Put them into your hand, then shuffle. Or you can create an XX green spirit creature token where X is the number of lands you control. You know what's interesting about this card? I do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. If you read that again, it does not say the word basic land. It's just any land, which we know historically can be a very powerful effect. When it dies, you search your life, you tutor for three, any three lands from your deck and put them into your hand. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's easy to read this card and be like, they don't go into play. It's any land and in case you didn't know that's very powerful lands are some of the most powerful things if now listen none of these cards are cheap well maybe a couple of them are but in general just being able to find your field of the dead your ancient tomb your nykthos shrine to nyx M my favorite thing with this one is because you get to get three is you can just get 
the Tron lands. You right. can get Urza's tower, uh, Urza's mine, and Urza's power plant, and put all of them and just get a ton of mana out of it, which is not usually viable in Commander, but it works with this. Definitely works with this. You can get combo stuff like Dark Depths and Thespian Stage. That's a combo that will allow you to immediately create Merit Lage, a 2020 Indestructible. Yeah, it's, is that good? <laughs> it's pretty good. If you somehow combine Kuro, with, you know, is in the 99, you could get Cabal Coffers and Urborg. You know, there's Gaius Cradles. And l- listen, this is a very powerful ability to so just find the, th- the three best lines in your deck. And not only that, do it again, you know, at some yes. point in the near future. And you'll definitely be able to cast it again, paying its commander uh, tax because you're going to get, you know, a bunch of lands that tap for a lot of mana. Nick, though, Shrine to Nix in a mono green deck can, it's great. can be just as good as Guy's Cradle. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah. Uh, well, and then the other, the issue you addressed with it is that, oh, it doesn't put them into play. But green has no lack of ways to get extra lands into play. Like, right. it is just loaded with them, and they print more all the time. Um, yeah, so you're going to play all the, play your extra lands. This is a, lands matter is a known deck. But like yeah. Azusa lets you play extra two extra lands a turn. Burgeoning lets you play up to three extra lands a turn. Wayward Swordtooth is lets you play an extra lands per turn. There's a yep. ton of these cards. So you're just going to play those so you, that you can play all the lands that you're tutoring out. And that will effectively pay for the commander tax cost. Yeah. So this one doesn't even need as much recursion. You can literally be like, sack it. It goes to the graveyard. I find three lands. I play the three lands, which gives me the mana to yeah. sack it and go find three lands. You Look, see how this circle's going. Yeah. We, we know how much cards that search up lands to pay for their own... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's Golosi, right? Yeah, it's Golosi. It's not going to be anywhere near as powerful as Golos, but like, because it doesn't also have an ability <laughs> that lets you use all that mana to play cards off the top of your deck for free. Yes, yeah. it does have a second ability though, and that is create an XX Green Spirit creature token where X is the number of lands you control. This is way less powerful. I I can't really see using this side of things all that often. I mean, maybe it just depends. On, I think on how the deck's built. If it's not dealt, bu- built with like a broken land strategy where you're just kind of, you know, you're getting Field of the Dead and Ancient Tomb and stuff. Sure. Then maybe you lean into the token part, you parallel lives doubling season, you make a few of these tokens, and it's like, yeah, now I'm making 12 12s, and like, I can yeah. pack this three times somehow, and like, that's a fair version of the tech, it feels like. Yeah, and that's that's fun. Yeah. Uh, okay. But I think, yeah, mostly people are going to do degenerate stuff with the lands, and it's going to be annoying because a lot of people, you know, feel like it's impossible to kill lands in Commander, which it's not, by the way. Play Strip Mine, play Wasteland. I know those are expensive. Play Ghost Quarter, play things that will get rid of some lands. Uh, It's worth it. Yeah. You don't have to be a land destruction deck to have a little bit to handle if people are abusing lands. Yep. Yeah, because the Kura doesn't get lands back from the graveyard. They'll have, I'm nope. sure they'll have some ways to do that, but still, that will hamper them. I uh-huh. think with all these Dragon Spirits, what you should be looking for to sort of gun down first is the sack outlets. If they play a Nationals Altar, yep. that is huge, your huge problem. Like, because if they can't sack the commander when they feel like it, then the deck, all these decks become a lot worse. Well, yeah, because if, if this is just, if it incidentally dies, you get one of these things, I don't think it's quite good enough to like be your commander. But as long as you build around it and you have those pieces... They, they all seem pretty neat. Quite good. All right, there are two... That's all the Dragon Spirits. We're, yep. we're, we're done with those. Whew. Okay. There are two more cycles of of things, and both of them are five monocolored legendary creatures that can be your commander, but none of them are actually realistic to run as your commander. Yeah. So the first cycle is the shrine, monocolored shrine cycles. Go Shintai of... I'm not going to read them all. The red one's Ancient Wars. The blue one's Lost Wisdom. Well, these are like shrines of the past, except there are legendary enchantment creatures. And they all do, they all have kind of the same play, which is that they have some effect that at your instep, for all of these, you can pay a certain amount, and then they will do something based on the number of shrines that you have out. Right. So the problem with running any one of these, let's take Goshintai of Lost Wisdom, the mono blue one. It's one in a blue for an 0-4 with flying, legendary enchantment creature shrine. Mm-hmm. Remember, shrine is not a creature type, it's an enchantment type. Yep. At the beginning of your end step, you may pay one. If you do, target player mills X cards where X is the number of shrines you control. The problem with this is there are only two other shrines in <laughs> mono blue, right? So it's difficult, and all the shrines are legendary. You can't even really clone them. Yeah. You could do some tricky stuff to get around the legendary rule. Blue's probably the most likely for this to work because of you cloning. Can but it's not realistic. You're just not going to run these shrines 
in a monocolor deck. You're going to run them into in a shrine deck that's sort of dedicated to that. So you're going to be five color, or it's going to be like two Vasa, and you're going to at least get three colors worth of shrine, so you can at least have like nine of them in your deck. Which And these all seem like great fun pieces for a shrine deck. Yeah. Um, but I just can't imagine having just the weak... If you are running these as your commander, you're just doing a monocolor deck with 99 cards, basically. Yeah, I mean, maybe you got tricky, and, and some maybe. people are going to take that as a challenge, and some people will probably try it. I just think, you know, that's a very fringe deck. So we're it's, not going to go deep on the shrines. That's all we're going to talk about them. Yep. Uh, the next cycle is also five monocolored legendary creatures. Now, this one is also a homage to a past cycle from Kamigawa. It is the Myojin... So the Myojin cycle, there are five of these again, one per color. Um, unfortunately, they are like the original Myojin. They all have this phrasing on them. When Myojin of such and such, let's use the red one. That, sure. Or, yeah, let's use the red one. Myojin of Roaring Blades. When it enters the battle, or sorry, Myojin of Roaring Blades enters the battlefield with an indestructible counter on it if you cast it from your hand. So right there, that wording, they all have it. That kind of precludes it from working very well as your commander because casting from the command zone is not casting it from your hand. So yeah. it will not get an indestructible counter. And the second ability on all these requires you to remove the indestructible counter to get some kind of effect. So the red one, Roaring Blades, deals seven damage to each of up to three targets. All of them do something different when you remove the indestructible counter, but none of them get the indestructible counter unless you cast them from your hand. So we'll talk a little bit in general of somebody, because people build phage decks. Sure. And like there are ways to get around this stuff, and it could be like a fun challenge to find a way to make it work. And, and some of them have pretty powerful effects if you could manage that payoff. The problem is they're all eight mana value, yeah. five and then three of their color to cast. And then you will have to generally cast them and then like bounce them to your hand and then recast it from your hand sure. to sort of get the thing going. And that makes it sort of pretty unrealistic because you're 16 mana in by the time that happens, it's not counting lot. whatever the bounce spell cost. So yeah, it's it's a lot to ask of uh, of anything. So let's talk about some, some workarounds to the cast clause here. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you got? Uh, well, uh, I mean, obviously you already mentioned, uh, bouncing your commander to your hand. Command beacon is the most obvious way command to do beacon, that. Yep. Yeah. Because it just, you sacrifice command beacon. It is a land that just taps for colorless. And when you sacrifice it, you put your commander, uh, into your hand from the command zone. So, so I'm not only do it. down eight mana, I'm down a land now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes, I could now cast my Myojin from my hand to get the awesome effect. Perhaps if you uh, really build your deck around tutoring that and being able to, I don't know, cast it every turn, then it, maybe that would work. I don't know. You have to get the command beacon back now. You need Crucible of Worlds or something. It's tough. It's difficult. Yeah. Decoction module is two mana for an artifact. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get an energy. But you can pay four, four, and tap the decoction module and return target creature you control to its owner's hand. That's another bounce that will work in any color deck. The other way to kind of do a workaround is instead of getting it to your hand is to, once it's on the battlefield, give it an indestructible counter another way. There's um, really only one colorless card that will do this. There's Tyrite Sanctum. There's actually only two cards, I think, in Magic that'll do it, period. Let's but this give is, it indestructible Yeah, characters. this is... And, and here's what you gotta do. So Tyrite Sanctum is a land. Taps for a colorless mana. You can pay two and tap it, and target legendary creature becomes a god in addition to its other types. Put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. That's not an indestructible counter. No. But <laughs> once you've done that, then you can activate the second ability of Tyrite Sanctum, which is pay four and tap it. Sack Tyrite Sanctum. Put an indestructible counter on target god. So, with this amazing workaround, if you spend two whole turns... At six mana, you seven, can, no, eight, because you're tapping the Tyrite Sanctum, too. Yeah, and then you just have to hope nobody removes <laughs> your, your giant threatening creature, right? That Fun. you've worked so hard to put an indestructible counter on. Yeah. Um, okay. I th actually, th we've got more stuff written down here, but this is going to be a really long episode. So, I, I just think the Myojin thing is not realistic. Like, mm. nobody's really going to do it. Um, which the blue, other, maybe blue because you could cast a clone like a phantasmal image, oh, which you sure. did cast from your hand. Wait, but is that gonna? I, I guess no. That then counts, you sack right? the original. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. the card just enters the battlefield and asks, "Did you cast from your hand?" And phantasmal image is like, "Yeah, I came from your hand." And you're like, "Cool, I sacked the original." Myojin goes back to my command zone. So maybe blue is the only one. And blue has proliferate. I, I, I want to see that happen. All right. <laughs> so the blue one. Let's read the blue one just so people know what it does. Because that's the most likely that maybe you can make it work. Still a lot of hoops to jump through. Yep. Five blue, blue, blue for a 3-3 three, three spirit. Uh, it enters the battlefield with an indestructible counter on it. If you cast it from your hand, mm -hmm. it says remove an indestructible counter from Myojin of Cryptic Dreams. 
copy target permanent spell you control three times. And just to be clear, that means it has to be on the stack. Right, it's a spell that is a permanent that's on the stack. But that's a powerful effect. It is so quite powerful. If you're doing some sort of clone doubling thing. Proliferate, so you get, you know, you can get five, six indestructible counters on this thing. Blues also, if you're going to jump through so many hoops, the best color to protect it because of the counter spells and stuff like that. Now, blue does have a bit of a difficulty getting to the eight mana yeah, that's a good in point. mono blue, but... If you yeah, can do it, mana drain. Yeah, maybe you uh, high tide. Yeah, like, there are ways it'll give you like that big push you need to make it happen. Because you get it out, and now it's okay if from that point forward I only have six mana. I just phantasmal image or whatever, and right. maybe get going. I don't know. That's it. Still seems like a lot of hoops, but maybe maybe blue could make it work. Right. Okay. That's it for the Myojin. We're not going to talk about the other ones. Uh, if you build a cool Myojin deck and you manage to make it work, go ahead. I'd love to see it. Yeah, tweet out at us and let us know because I would love to yep. see it. But it, I think it's more fringy like a Phage deck or something like that. Yep. All right. After the break, we are going to come back and we are going to talk about all of the non-cycle monocolored commanders. And there are a lot of them. We are just getting started. So yeah, don't go anywhere. Cool ones. Yep. We will be right back after this message from our sponsors. When the Command Zone first began, it was just Jimmy and me. But since then, we've grown into a team of talented editors, skilled VFX artists, and writers so masterful, I consider them my personal heroes. Really, guys? Hiring is not easy, though. If you want to find the best people, you need the best tools. That's why we use Indeed, the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Browsing tons of different job sites just takes too long, but Indeed can do it all. Plus, it's the only job site where you don't pay anything unless you find candidates that meet your requirements. That is time and money you could spend getting gifts for your beautiful writers. All right, come on, guys. And Indeed saves you more time with talent-finding tools like virtual interviews and Instant Match, which gives you a short list of candidates the moment you sponsor a post. Then you can invite them to apply right away, like when, I don't know, you need to hire a new writing team ASAP. Mm -hmm. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Command Zone. This offer is valid through March 31st, so go to Indeed.com slash Command Zone to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Again, Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Yo, what up? I'm Galia of the Endless Dance, and I like to party! Woo! Dancing makes me feel good! That's why I always wear me undies. They aren't just like the world's most comfortable underwear. They're like how I express myself. I mean, look at these awesome tiger patterns. How cool is that? And me undies are made of super soft and sustainable material so I can be comfortable enough to dance all night long. So stop worrying about having enough coins to do lame laundry and spend more time on the dance floor. Get the me undies membership. Why do you need a membership? Well, I mean, you don't really, but it's Fun! See, each month you get a banging new pair of undies that match your style delivered right to your door. <laughs> then you can worry less about boring things like washing your clothes. Plus, the membership saves you up to 30% on like everything they make. So party in your underpants! Don't stop! Always dance! To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash command. That's MeUndies.com slash command. Seriously, they're the most comfortable undies you'll ever wear. Hi, Vorinclex Voice of Hunger here, and I speak for all the hungry people and praters out there when I say we want to eat and we want to eat now. That's why we need Factor, the meal service where you never have to wait to sate your world-consuming cravings. It's a new year. You're working on the grind, tapping down lands. You don't have time to cook or shop. But Factor's pre-completed meals are delivered ready to eat in just two minutes. Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7 with fresh, never frozen, prepared meals that are so delicious you wouldn't believe they're actually good for you. And whether you want vegan options, extra protein, or literally all the food like me, Factor's got you covered. With over 27 options each week, even a ravenous devourer of planes won't get bored. That said, I could eat their chive and garlic chicken forever. So remember folks, listen to the voice of your hunger when it says, try Factor today. Head to go.factor75.com slash plans and use code COMMAND120 to get $120 off over your first five weeks of meals. That's code COMMAND120 at go.factor75.com slash plans for $120 off. 
All right, we are back. We are talking about the mono-colored legendary creatures from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. We've talked about all the cards that are in cycles, and now we're talking about, I don't know, the one-offs? Is that what you call them? Yeah, the, the non-cycles. <laughs> I well, hope they don't feel bad that we're calling them that. These, there's a lot of cool stuff in here, so um, we're going to have a lot to say, so let's just jump right into it. The first one is Goro Goro, Disciple of Ryuse. It is a 2-2 two -two for one and a red. A legendary goblin samurai. Like that. You can pay red and creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. Quite good. Yeah. And then an interesting ability. Three red red, colon, create a 5-5 five five red dragon spirit creature token with flying. Activate only if you control an attacking modified creature. And to remind everybody out there, a creature is considered modified if it has either an aura, an equipment, or a counter of some kind on it. So uh, it, this is interesting because obviously the haste is cool. Yeah, I mean, haste in itself is already a very powerful ability. But then as many times as you have three red red, because it's colon, you don't have to tap Goro or anything, you can make five five dragons, but you can only do that during combat when a modified creature is currently attacking. And a modified creature you control. It can't even be like, oh, Jordan's attacking, or sorry, Jimmy's attacking with a modified creature. Great, let's dump all my mana into making dragons. It has to be yours. So there's uh, some hoops, some 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 things you gotta jump through in order to make this work, but it does seem pretty powerful. It's, it's also um, a, a little interesting that because of you have to create that in combat, you can't really give those dragons haste and attack with them the turn oh, they Oh, that's come a out. really interesting, yeah, you can't. You'd have to have an additional combat step or something yeah. because, yeah, the, you're already in combat. There's no, uh, like, the thing's already attacked. Sure. So there's no way to create a dragon in that moment and get it into combat. You'd need another combat step. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about good haste targets, stuff you want to give haste to, because I think that's the easiest part of Goro, Goro to use. Yeah. Uh, and that would be things like Atali. Atali's great. Ilharg. Ilharg is amazing. Uh, just any big Eldrazi with Annihilator seems good. You know, if yeah. that betrays, you have to have 13 mana because you need the extra mana. Yeah, it, haste just kind of like changes how you think about cards. If normally you play them and someone removes them before they get to attack with haste, they're great. I recently uh, said that I thought haste was the most underrated mechanic in Commander. I think it's extremely powerful if you use it correctly. And on Goro Goro, it is easy to use it correctly because all your creatures will have haste for most of the game because this is a two-mana Commander. Oh, yeah. He's super cheap to play out. And then the haste enabler is just one red, which just does not cost you very much. Yeah. You can even play multiple creatures later in the game and give them haste, which is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Okay. Giving something haste is not, you know, that interesting to talk about. It's obviously good. No, it's good. Let's talk about easy modifications, though, because in order to sort of turn on the second ability, you need modified creatures to be attacking. Mm -hmm. You don't need a lot of modified creatures, though, so I think the strategy is a little different than some of the other modified stuff we're going to talk about or have talked need, about. Just need one, as long as you can have one modified creature attacking. The second modified creature attacking does nothing for you, actually. Nope. Uh, so... Sword of the Animist is a good one. A Metallic Mimic is actually a cool one because you just name a creature type that you have enough of and you're going to get... It's, it doesn't cost you any additional mana to equip or anything. just comes and gets a 1-1 one, one counter. Sure, I like that. Yeah. Uh, Lightning Greaves obviously also gives haste, but maybe sometimes you wouldn't have the extra mana or you just want to protect it or... Yep. You know. Always uh, just a good card, so... Then uh, just creatures that modify themselves, I think, can be really strong. Uh-huh. So Krenko, 10 Street Kingpin is a really good one. Two and a red for a 1-2. Whenever uh, it attacks, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. Then that, uh, then create a number of 1-1 one, one goblin creature tokens equal to Krenko's power. So the first time you attack, you turn sideways to attack. It becomes a 2-2. Two, two, it makes two goblins. And again, you can give him haste. So as soon as you play him, he attacks, becomes modified. Makes the goblins. He's Now he's in combat and he's modified. The interesting thing is there's no trigger... Goro just checks when you try to activate the ability. Yep. Is there a modified creature that is technically attacking right now? Yep. So, you know, you can stack all that and make that work. There's uh, things like Tarine Mauler mm -hmm. um, that can obviously get a lot of counters. Or, or there are mechanics like Riot, Dethrone, Unleash. Sure. That you play cards and they just get counters. R Riot's a good one because normally, or a lot of times, you'll play it and you kind of just want the haste out of it. But you already have haste. So you want the counters so you can get the modified creature in this. Yeah, so, so now that we can turn on Goro Goro, how do we make enough dragons to make this worth it? Because you have to activate it at instant speed. So yeah. stuff like Mana Geyser, Jessica's Will, that normally the big red spells that we would get a lot of mana from, 
difficult to use here. That mana is going to go away and you can't get it during combat because you can't cast those at instant speed generally. Obviously, with Fidelcanor and some stuff, you could maybe try to make that work. Yeah. There's a really interesting interaction with Elena Kessig Trapper. Yeah, I like this. This is like a, a little interesting. Um, so Alina Kessig Trapper, who is four and a red for a legendary creature, Human Scout, 4-3 as first strike. And Elena has the ability to tap and add a number of red mana equal to the greatest power among creatures you control uh, that entered the battlefield this turn. Uh, so Elena, with haste, taps for four red. Yeah. Which is, I mean, the turn you play her. Yep. Right? So... Now, if on the next turn or, or a subsequent turn, or you can even do this if you had a lot of mana at the beginning of turn, you can now sort of combo her with something maybe like Staff of Domination. Sure. So Staff of Domination is three mana for an artifact, and it has a bunch of abilities. One of the abilities is you pay three, tap the Staff of Domination, and untap target creature. Another ability is you pay one, untap the Staff of Domination. So for four mana, you can kind of reset parity if you have a tap creature and yep. a staff. So as long as Elena is going to make at least five mana, which you know how to make Elena make five mana, make one of the dragons. Yes. <laughs> so if you tap Elena and you make a dragon somehow, yeah, and you've got four mana left over, three mana left over, three mana left over, then you can tap the Staff of Domination to untap Elena, and now you're there because you Elena tap taps for five, five, Staff of Domination, three, or sorry, one to untap it, three to untap Elena. Now your infinite mana zone and infinite mana yeah. will make infinite dragons and it can all happen in instant speed. It's dragon time. Yep. That's some, some cool hoops to jump through to get there. But, and then you, I mean, the interesting thing about that is you're going to make infinite five, five flying dragons, but unless you have another thing to give combat, another combat to it, you're not going to be able to take advantage of that, that turn. Which makes me think maybe you do want some, you know, extra, extra combats, combats in this somewhere. I think you do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also mana echoes, which is two red, red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, you may add an amount of colorless mana equal to the number of creatures you control that share a creature type with it. So if you have let's say five dragons or four dragons and you make one, it enters the battlefield and goes, oh, there are four other dragons that share a creature type with me. You get four colorless mana. Now it's colorless mana and Goro Goro's ability requires some red mana thrown in there. So you might have to filter that colorless mana through like a chromatic orrery or right. a gemstone array or something like that uh, to kind of turn that into enough to make enough dragons to continue going. But once you're doing that, you're infinite dragons again. Yeah, you've got as many dragons as you want. And infinite mana. Sure. Because eventually you'll get, like, I'm creating my 27th dragon, so I'm only using five of that mana, and 22 of it's getting saved over here. Yep. If you're going to do that, it just feels like you don't even need, now need to attack with the dragons. You're just going to kill everybody with, like, walking ballista or yeah. something like that. Just anything that you can dump infinite mana into and kill people. Walking ballista seems really good, too, because it's a creature that comes out and is modified, right? Yeah, that's true. So you give it haste, and it's, it's meeting the criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, this Goro Goro seems pretty powerful for a two-mana card. I like it. It seems really good. I, I kind of imagine it'll be really good to put into other decks where you need haste, too. Yeah. But on its own, haste, it, it seems like a powerful little uh, trick there. All right, the next one is also a mono red commander. Do you want to read it? Yes. So this is uh, Heiko, Heiko Yamazaki, the general. Uh, so this is the first of the, uh, what people are calling the sisters Yamazaki because it is a slight reference to the brothers Yamazaki. Yeah, from, from OG previous. Kamigawa, yep. Um, and uh, Heiko, Yam uh, Heiko Yamazaki is three and a red for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature human samurai who has trample. And whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, you may cast target artifact card from your graveyard this turn. Mm. So that's interesting. Yeah, reminder, you still have to pay the mana cost for the artifact. You're just allowed to cast it until the end of turn. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit similar to Io in that I think you're going to want some Cheerios. Yeah. You're going to want low mana cost artifacts because it's great if you attack with a Samurai or Warrior and then you can cast something for free. You don't, it doesn't cost you any mana, but you're going to get the card advantage. So the Bobbles, Mishra's Bobble, Urza's right. Bobble seem really good. Jeweled Lotus, uh -huh. something like that. The Mox Amber, stuff like that. Because Jeweled Lotus might help you get Heiko out on turn one. And then turn two, you're just like, yep, I'll get the Jeweled Lotus back. That uh -huh. seems great. So now if you even kill Heiko, I'm just, uh, whatever, I'm just going to cast it again pretty sure, easily. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, that seems powerful, but let's talk about more artifacts that you could recur besides zero cast stuff because, you know, it gets a little boring to just talk about that. A lot of the artifacts that, like, sacrifice themselves and just do powerful things, like Mind Slaver. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah, you yeah I remember that one. <laughs> Pe- people will love you for that one. You're going to make some friends. But uh, if you sack Mind Slaver, target one player, mm-hmm. then attack with Heiko and get Mind Slaver back. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're down to 1v1, that can just be game. Yeah, exactly. It's often just game if you're not, though, because you take a player's turn and use that player against another player and then take the next player's turn and then, you know. And it just it, it just takes both of them into a really bad position. Um, Nevin Ryle's Disc is a pretty good one. A- any of those cards that are uh, like uh, board wipes on a stick that you could just keep having back and then you get to hold it over people. So if you can give Heiko indestructible somehow, dark sure. steel plate or something, uh huh, then you could, yep, crack the Nev's disc, destroy everything, attack with Heiko, put it back out. And you only need one samurai or warrior to attack with and keep it going. So Brutal. And it's like, hey, I'm just going to do this every turn. What, you're not going to stick anything for this game. That's brutal. Mm. I-, I love this last one. Hope of Girapur. Mm. So, uh, Hope of Girapur, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a one-mana legendary artifact creature, Thopter, and his flying. It's a 1-1. One, one. And when you sacrifice it, you can sacrifice Hope of Girapur, and until your next turn, target player who was dealt combat damage by Hope of Girapur this turn can't cast non-creature spells. So, if someone is playing a spell slinger deck or something, you can, like, kind of lock them out with this. I think the way it works, because you got an attack trigger... Uh, attack alone and then this thing has to hit them that so is maybe it's like every other turn but still like yeah powerful and just gives you the ability if you again if you get down to 1v1 or later in the game and you're like i just want to turn that deck off you can kind of do it at least for a turn or two yep that seems uh, pretty brutal yeah that's i was gonna say that's cool but it's it's a little mean but also cool <laughs> uh it can be both it, can, <laughs> it definitely can be both okay you're obviously gonna want to fill your graveyard because you're not you know you need the the artifacts to get in there uh-huh. so that you can recur them and get the value. Because the worst thing ever is you go to attack with Heiko and you don't have an artifact in your graveyard and you're just not getting the uh, the, the value. Yeah. So fortunately, red is pretty good with getting things in the graveyard, not through self-mill exactly, but through uh, things like faithless looting. Yeah, stuff that's like not rummaging. exactly card advantage, right. but yeah, rummaging and stuff like that. Cathartic reunion. That's a really good one. Uh, it's a one in a red for a sorcery as an additional cost to cast this spell. Discard two cards, and then you draw three cards. So you replace the two cards you discarded and Cathartic Reunion. Yep. Pretty efficient for two mana. And not only that, you get to choose the cards you put in there. So yeah. you can just be like, okay, I'm going to put you know Jeweled Lotus even in there because I don't need it at the moment. I can get it back on my attack trigger, but now I'm replacing it with a card off my deck. Right. So it's causing me to draw a card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that seems pretty... Powerful as far as Red's ability to get things into the graveyard. Obviously, they also have Wheel of Fortune and things like that, which will do a lot all at once. A very expensive card, though. Yeah. And then let's talk about Samurai's Warriors, because I think it's easy to miss that Heiko doesn't actually care if she is the one attacking. She just wants it to... It's like it's like exalted for a Samurai or a Warrior. Right. Probably because there weren't enough Samurais. They're like <laughs> looking around being like, okay. Like, if it's just Samurai, yeah. no one will play this. Yeah. So we gotta, we're got we going to say Warriors too. But they, there's surprisingly not a ton of really good Samurais or Warriors, but there are some. There are some neat ones. Yeah. Um, I, I like Neheb the Eternal. It is a three red red for a legendary creature, um, Zombie Minotaur Warrior. There's the Warrior in there. And it is is a 4-6, and it has a flick 3, but that's not important. And well, if it gets blocked, it will deal. they'll still take 3 damage, which is good. important, yeah. Yeah, that's actually very important. I'm, I I rescind my statement. <laughs> um, at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, you also add red for each one life your opponents have lost this turn, which is super useful for casting those enchantments. Yeah, because you don't want to only do zero-cost things. Let's say you got the Mind Slaver thing going on, then you're going to be like, boom, that gives me the extra mana to now cast that Mind Slaver again or whatever. So yeah, Neheb seems really good. There's Layla, the Blade Reforged, which exiles cards off the top of your library that you can play until end of turn. Because if you just attack with Heiko, you only get the... Uh, artifact recurrence. So it's nice to get a little more value, a, a little more card advantage out of the attack. Morag gives you extra attack steps, yep. um, but is also a warrior. Mm-hmm. And then we actually skipped one important card for the fill your graveyard because Red's actually pretty good at like grab entombing an artifact, basically grabbing an yeah. artifact, putting in your deck. So Goblin Engineer is a really good card in the deck because when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for an artifact, put it into your graveyard, then shuffle your library, which that kind of effect, very powerful when you can just get that artifact out. So yep, very yeah, cool. I think this is a pretty cool deck. It's mono red artifacts recursion. 
Yeah. So I th- we've felled in Doretti. There, we've seen versions of this. This is a Samurai Warrior version, which is probably honestly like a little less powerful than those others, just because the ability has to be on attack. Which it seems is always neat a though. Harder. Yeah. I, I'd like to like you know see this deck in action. See if we can get those Samurais and Warriors to to work together on that. All right, let's go to the next one, which is the sister. Is it officially a sister, or are we just calling it? You they know, have the same last name. It's unclear whether they are descended from the two brothers Yamazaki, or whether they are sisters Yamazaki themselves. This is one of these things where we get ourselves in trouble, like Elena and Halana. <laughs> yeah. In some way, though, people are calling them the sisters Yamazaki. That's not us. So, Norika Yamazaki, the poet, is the white one. Two and a white for a three-two. Human samurai, legendary creature with vigilance. Very similar to Heiko, says, whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, you may cast target enchantment card from your graveyard this turn. So this is basically the exact same buffer enchantments and not artifacts, and it's mono white, not mono red. White has a lot of enchantment yeah. support, though. There's a lot of interesting enchantments, like, in white. Uh, there's not as much that, like self sacks itself like artifacts do but there are some i think um, there's actually quite a few auras that or not auras enchantments that sack themselves and they feel like a bunch of different roles so like there are removal ones yeah or of silence that Handle is a, that is a taxing and it also you can sack it to uh-huh. destroy something and then get it back with with uh i was gonna say Heiko, but it's uh, norika yeah um, yep, Candle Trap. Candle it's trap. like a pacifism, but then you can pay an additional mana to sack it and exile the creature that is enchanting. Yeah, so which, it gets rid of it long term. And then when you can keep bringing the Candle Trap back, that's a nice way to just have pretty powerful removal going on there. Yeah, so then we've also got Protection for our commander. There's stuff like Angelic Renewal, which we talked about earlier. Alcide of Life's Bounty is one mana for uh, an enchant creature, Nymph. It's a got lifelink so this is an enchantment creature you can pay one and sacrifice it target creature or enchantment you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn so Mm -hmm. you can actually protect your enchantments as well if you wanted to like protect that aura of silence yeah that's pretty cool which is slowing somebody down a lot or whatever so that's pretty sweet and then there's just general utility this is a cool one which is interesting with this the ability to sack and bring it back Yeah, so Solitary Confinement, uh, which is two and a white for an enchantment, which is at the beginning of your upkeep, you sacrifice Solitary Confinement unless you discard a card. And it makes you skip your draw step, and it says, you have Shroud and prevent all damage that would be dealt to you. That's a very powerful effect. Yeah, you can't take damage and you can't be targeted. But the downside is you will slowly run out of cards because you can't draw any during your draw step. You skip your draw step and you have to discard a card every single turn. The thing is, though, what you can do is you can sack it. Yeah. Then you can draw for turn and then you can attack with a singular samurai or warrior and just bring it back out. Which there's certainly like a little area of vulnerability there. But realistically, what you're worried about is losing damage on other people's turns. For the most part, yeah. And you can just kind of... Get rid of that downside for it, which is really nice. There's also a uh, Curse of Silence, which is a, a newish card from Midnight Hunt, right? One white for an enchantment or a curse. Enchant player. As Curse of Silence enters the battlefield, choose a card name. Spells with the chosen card name uh, Enchanted Player cast cost two more to cast and then whenever enchanted player casts a spell with the chosen name you may sacrifice curse of silence if you do draw a card in general you can it's one white mana so you name their commander you know they're going to try and play that at some point right it makes it cost two more and when they do cast it they're like fine i'm going to cast it you can choose to sacrifice curse of silence and draw the card to replace it now it's sitting in your graveyard and you could go all right i attack with my samurai warrior i cast curse of silence and i name somebody else's commander it's just, just name like the lowest CMC thing each time, I guess. It's just like giving them a little bit of extra commander tax, <laughs> <laughs> which sure. can be annoying. <laughs> right. It's certainly going to make them not happy with you. That's yeah. for sure. Also, you could just say soul ring or whatever if you sure. want to. Um, you know, I feel uh, like you're less yeah. likely to eventually get it back if you... Yeah, it's you hard know. to tell when somebody has a soul ring. You know they're always going to want to cast their commander for the most part. Right. I, I've, I've only seen Curse of Silence played a few times, but every time somebody names a commander with it. And then, of course, there are sagas, and sagas get to the final chapter and sacrifice themselves, except sagas from Neon Dynasty, which turn into yeah, creatures, yeah. <laughs> uh, but still do Elspeth Conquers Death or some of the sagas. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think... Oh, I guess we've got to talk about the fill your graveyard part. The self mill part right. of mono white, which mono white is pretty bad. Nothing is like really built into mono white to do that most of the time. You have to pretty much lean on artifacts yeah. in order to get it done. So it's mes- mesmeric or perpetual uh-huh. timepiece. Those are ways to mill yourself. 
then let's talk about Samurais and Warriors. And I would say White also is much worse here. The Red Samurais and Warriors are way better than the White Samurais and Warriors. Well, and also, like, I was looking through the White Samurais and Warriors, and a lot of them want to attack with other people, like, have Yeah, a lot of their that. synergy is, like, give another warrior this when you attack with it. Which is not going to work with the only one attacks kind of thing, so. But still, there's Ironclad Slayer, which, yeah, that gets an aura equipment from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, and that just kind of is a nice little regrowth when you already are going to want to have a bunch of those in your graveyard. Yeah, you can be like, oh, I've got two in there. I'm going to get this one in my hand. I'm going to cast that one with Heiko's mm -hmm. ability. Um, Dauntless Avon. It, I mean, you can tell we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, but when uh, it attacks, you can untap target creature you control. Uh, this is one you found, which I think is good. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of spicy uh, for this, which is is uh, Sensei Golden Tail, and it's one in a white for a 2-1 legendary creature fox samurai. Now you're going to have to read Bushido. It has Bushido 1, which is sort of relevant because uh, Bushido is when this uh, blocks or becomes blocked, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. So if you're attacking with it, Harder to block. Yeah, yeah. But it has one and a white and tap and put a training counter on target creature. That creature gains Bushido 1 and becomes a samurai in addition to its other creature types. Play this ability only anytime you could play a sorcery. So maybe you could get away with playing some non-samurai. Yeah. And you're probably still going to have Sun Titan and some stuff like that in a sure. mono white deck. So you can just be like, okay, now I turn into samurai and it can, you know, it can trigger my commander's ability. And then you can have that one attack. Yeah. You don't have to worry about there not being enough samurais. So white samurais and warriors not that great, but white is one of the exalted colors. And this is kind of a glorified exalted commander. So you can actually play things like Sublime Archangel, which give your other creatures you control exalted. So if you happen to have three or four creatures and you just attack with one of them, they're all sort of buffing the one that's attacking. So it kind of um, mitigates the downside of you have to only attack with one to make that work. There's Angelic Benediction, which is an enchantment with exalted. Whenever a creature you control attacks alone, you may... Uh, tap target creature might make it easier to get in there also yeah. just gives the plus one plus one and it's enchantment you can get back mm -hmm. cathedral of war this could actually go in the Heiko deck as well but it says um it's a land and it comes in the battlefield tapped but it has exalted so whenever a creature you control attacks alone it gets plus one plus one until end of turn and then you just tap it for a colorless mana so in a deck that wants to attack with things alone sure cathedral of war seems quite good it's there just it a land that gives plus one plus one yeah i think both of these seem fine i think the red one's going to be better just because red's better than white, basically. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're both a little niche, and I think that the attacking alone thing is is a bit of a restriction on really making it happen. Oh, yeah. Because it's not like you can do your huge attack with everything turn and then also pull something back to the battlefield. But I, I, think, I think they're cool. I would also say that if you consider that magic has five colors, right? Uh-huh. Well, if it had a six color, what would that color be? Well, like purple? The colorless. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. So in some ways, the red deck is two colors, uh -huh. whereas the white deck is still only one color because it does not have... Enchantments are not colorless, whereas artifacts are. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. So it's a two-color deck and one's a one-color deck. So, uh -huh. I mean, in some ways. All right. We are down to the next one, which is a big one. This is a big boy. Yeah. And, and one people were very excited about. We'll probably spend a little bit of time on it. It's pretty crazy. It's the new Jingataxius Progress Tyrant. Five blue blue, seven mana. For a five five, legendary creature, Phyrexian Praetor. Whenever you cast an artifact, instant, or sorcery spell, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. This ability triggers only once each turn. Has a reminder text, a copy of a permanent spell becomes a token. Yep. And then whenever an opponent casts an artifact, instant, or sorcery spell, counter that spell. This ability triggers only once each turn. Wow. So kind of doubles your instant sorceries and artifacts and halves your opponents, kind of. You're the only one who can make progress. You are the progress tyrant. <laughs> Everyone else would be like, well, I don't want to cast anything. It's just going to get countered. <laughs> I do feel like your opponents are not going to like playing against this card. I'm not sure it's as oppressive. I mean, comparing it to the original Jingataxius, which is like notoriously salt-inducing. Well, it, it, this the, is not as salty, I, I don't think. Uh, the original one, if you get that Jingataxius out and you make it around a turn... You've won the game. like Because everybody I've, has no cards in hand. Yeah, like, I, I've, I've scooped to games where someone just manages to get a Jenga Taxis out and protect it for a whole round, and then you're like, well, this game is over. Because you have be all the cards and card. we have no cards, yeah. Yeah, and I don't think this is quite that good, but this is very good. Um, I think it actually might be better as a commander than Jenga Taxis is, but probably a little bit worse in the 99. I agree with that. We're going to talk about that here, obviously, because there's a lot to break down here. I think the first thing I thought of when I saw this card is that flash equals flexibility. Yeah. 
instants are so much better than sorceries and artifacts because it says this ability triggers only once each turn. Not each of your turns, no. which I think would have balanced it a lot better, and that's probably a mistake that they didn't have that wording. Uh-huh. Because now, instants become a thing where, like, I play an instant on my turn, I play an instant on your turn, I play it on Jimmy's turn, I play it on, you know, Mel's turn, and I've gotten to double up all those instants. I mean, I need a lot of mana, and they have to be small instants, but... If you're doing sorceries or artifacts, you feel like to get full value, you would have to cast big things, you know, six, seven CMC stuff. Yeah. Just so you don't miss your opportunity. And that is a lot more dangerous because I can't leave my mo- my mana open for other things. So it just feels like you can still be low to the ground, low mana value if you're mostly instance. And that leaves you the most flexibility to be like, okay, you didn't do anything. I will use my double up my thing on my brainstorm. Fine. And I'll leave my man open for the next turn. And just imagine how brutal it will feel as an opponent when a, the Jenga Taxi's player is able to just leave up all their blue mana, you know, like and they just go, go, you know, there's just nothing you can do. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? You, you go to remove it. They almost certainly, first of all, the first thing you go to remove it with gets countered. Yeah. So you have to team up with an opponent and be like, listen, I'll do this, and on my turn, do you have an, a spell? You do that. And then that thing, if they counter that thing, th- that means we need three spells to get through their one counter spell. Just brutally difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, I think you're going to play the, the highly played, most common blue instance, like Brainstorm, Rapid Hybridization. High Tide seems amazing. Yeah, you know, cast High so Tide, good. now all your islands tap for three. But to maximize the new Jin Gitaxis, you're really going to want to... Think about which instants are the best to copy. Mm-hmm. And there are a bunch. Yeah, so, a whole lot. So let's look at there. There's this whole... Um, there's the cards that untap lands when you cast them. And they're already pretty good most of the time. And something that just automatically doubles it all the time, they are so good. So look at like Frantic Search. Two and a blue. Instant. Draw two cards. Discard two cards. Untap three lands. You're going to draw two... Discard two, untap three lands, then do that again. So you come up mana. You're up three mana at the end of this. And you've looked at four new cards and chosen the best of those. Yeah, a a snap, which is just an instant for one and a blue, which is return target creature to its owner's hand. Untap up to two lands. Bounce a creature, gain two mana. Holy (laughs) crap. So good. (laughs) Yeah, because... Yeah, I mean, if it was zero mana, it'd be broken. It's actually plus two mana. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. There's also Rewind, which is counter-target spell, and tap four lands. These are cards that are going to be extremely powerful in the deck. Really, really Because powerful. it's going to look like, oh, they could only have one counter spell, right? They only got two mana up. We've got three, you know, whatever. So then they're be like, okay, in response, I snap that, untap four lands. Now I counter that and counter that and your whole plan's gone, and now you got no removal spells between all of you. Yeah. Y'all had to work together just for that to happen to you. Yeah, and then it's like, well, they still have a full hand and lots of things to do, and you used up all your cards trying to make something happen. It, it's That seems brutal. Uh, modal spells are going to be really, really good, and one thing I will say about uh, decks that play at instant speed is you have actually a much higher ability to play high mana value, high CMC stuff, because the danger with the sorcery speed high CMC thing is you play it, and now I'm waiting through three people's turns, crossing my fingers that like it sticks. They don't do anything that I would want to stop with some of my other spells. And you have to make yep. the decision early and lock into it. Whereas with spells like Sublime Epiphany, Mystic Confluence, the classic Cryptic Command, Cryptic Command. These are spells that are pretty high CMC, a little bit difficult to cast, have a huge effect, but you can cast them when you know you're safe on your own end step or like, oh, I'm going to cast during Jimmy's turn. And yeah, Mel's still got a turn here, but it's only one turn, not three people's turn that I'm holding my breath through. I mean, look at Sublime Epiphany, just backbreaking. It's just insane. Yeah, just <laughs> just completely back. just so much value out of six mana. Uh, other spells that are good to copy, artifacts that have flash. And there are some. Torrential Gear Hulk. Wouldn't it be great to Torrential Gear Hulk into make two Torrential Gear Hulks and uh, one of them targets your Sublime Epiphany and the other targets your, you know, whatever else you got in your graveyard? I'd love it. I think <laughs> it'd be very good. So I just have two five sixes. I also counted your thing, made another token copy of my Torrential Gear Hulk, probably. Yeah. You know, got some more value off whatever. Yeah, that seems insane. Uh, Shimmer Mirror. Oh, boy. This oh, like, yeah. I was like, oh, you should play Vidalcanori in this deck. And I was like, no, Shimmer Mirror's way better. That just kind of does it for you. It is a three mana, two, two mirror with flash. You may cast artifact spells as though they had flash. I'll take two Shimmer Mirrors, actually, which makes it way harder to get rid of, right? Oh, that would be, oh, that'd be so bad. And now all your mana rocks. 
you cast them on other people's turn and make two mana rocks. two of them. So Arcane Signet becomes mana even. Wow. Soul Ring becomes, you know, four mana for one mana. I mean, the biggest difficulty in this deck is going to be getting Jin Gataxius out the first yes. time. Yes. But the more we talk about it, the more I think about it, it's just like this deck is going to be huge. I think if you get Powerful. Jin Gataxius out with eight mana... And so you've got one mana left for your swan song or whatever. Yeah. It's safe. Because they'll need three counter spells to get through. Or, or sorry, removal spells. Remember, their first one will get countered by the Jinji Taxi's ability. That ability protects itself very well. Yeah. So most kill spells are instants or sorceries. Uh, okay, here's another thing that's just broken with Jinji Taxius. And we've already mentioned this before. Extra turn extra spells. Turns. Oh my gosh. So cap copying extra turn spells is just brutal right expropriate karn's temporal sundering temporal mastery if you cast one of those spells and you get two of them that that's pretty much game over i mean like, you already pretty much win if you cast an expropriate if you cast an expropriate with jenga taxi's progress tyrant out you double win <laughs> you you're probably gonna get four extra turns steal you know it's over. But I think people will just scoop if you cast Expropriate with Jinga Taxius out. I, I can't imagine playing a game against a Jinga Taxius player and them casting Expropriate and me saying, okay, let's play it out. Yeah, let's see if, I, <laughs> if we could live through this. So, I mean, people do not like extra turn sex in general in Commander, but it will be very powerful. And then we wanted to talk about regarding counter spells. I think you're still going to play some amount of counter spells. They're not great to be copied by the ability. No. I mean, you will win any counterspell war. Yeah, and, and that's the nice part about it because, like, you cast it once and you just aim both those counterspells at the thing. That spell's pretty much countered. Yeah, because they need two counterspells just to counter your two counters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're still going to play your Fierce Guardianships and your Force of Wills and whatever if you've yeah. got the high-powered version or, you know, your Dispels and your Negates and things if you've, you know, probably playing those anyway. Because you're if Jin Gitaxia sticks around and you untap with it, it's going to be hard to imagine that you're not in a very commanding position in any game no yes. matter how you built that tech. And then, this is the part I like, Jordan. Uh -huh. I'm going to call this uh, segment Stack Complexity. So, there's some tricky, tricky, tricky stuff you can do with Blink Spells and oh, yeah. Jinga Taxius. So, let's look at Ghostly Flicker. Ghostly Flicker is like one of my favorite cards in Magic, just period. Or uh, Essence Flux. These uh -huh. both have similar things. So, Ghostly Flicker is two and a blue, Exile Two target artifacts, creatures, and or lands you control, then return those cards to the battlefield under your control. Essence Flux is just exile target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under your, its owner's control. If it's a spirit, it gets one one counter. Here's the thing. You cast that spell, targeting Jin Gitaxius. It gets doubled. It's your first spell mm -hmm. for this turn. So there's two Ghostly Flickers on the stack targeting Jin Gitaxius. Yep. And Ghostly Flicker can actually target a land you control also to basically pseudo untap it. Sure. So let's imagine that it basically costs two to cast Ghostly Flicker. Actually, it's going to end up costing one because you're going to copy it. But the, here's the thing. The first one you let resolve, it blinks Jinga Taxius, which comes back immediately. This is why you don't want to use the ones that come back on unstep. Right. So now Jinga Taxius comes back. You've got two lands untapped because you targeted a land, let's say. Or it could be a soul ring or something that gives you more mana. Sure. But now this is a new Jinga Taxius. It doesn't know that you already copied a spell this turn. It's like, I'm ready to copy the first spell you cast this turn. Right? So you can now be like, oh, I'm going to cast my high tide now. It's going to make two high tides. Right. Both of those high tides are going to resolve. So now all of my remaining islands tap for three mana. I still have a ghostly flicker on the stack, everybody. I can let that resolve or I could be like, oh, I'm going to do, you know, something else. And then boom, Jingitaskius goes away. Ghostly flicker. Now we're back. Now... I, I bounced, or I, I flickered another land. It's now, a lot. Jinga Taxius is reset. Maybe I want to cast Essence Flux now. There's way, there's interesting things to do with Twin Cast in there. Like, if you manipulate the stack, there's Turnabout still exists. Well, and if you have stuff like Archaeomancer and Mnemonic Wall, you can also keep bringing that Ghostly Flicker back to your hand as it's being doubled, which, like, every time you cast it, you get to double it again. You could potentially just, like, I feel like you could pretty easily create infinite mana with this sort of thing. You could just do... Depending on what your pieces are, you can just do a ton of different stuff, but this is a way to pretty easily say, uh, you know that whole thing where I can only do this once per turn? Uh, I'm actually going to do this as many times as I feel like this turn. This strikes me as one of those things that you'll do on a turn and be like, all right, everyone, you know, go take a bathroom break. <laughs> I'm just going to figure out how this works. It's going to be a while as I work this out, but it's going to be cool. Yeah, so I think that without a doubt, this new Jinga Taxi is more powerful than the original when it's played as your commander. Yeah. Uh, and definitely going to be the type of card that 
is groan inducing, I think, in most play groups. Like as I was putting this together, I was like, this is cool. I want to play this. And then as I kept doing it, I was like, no one's going to like me. I'm not going to build this. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not going to build this deck because it's just going to be brutal. Yeah. I mean, the tough part is if you see someone playing Jenga Taxis, like normally if it's like, oh, this is such a brutal kill on site commander, what you do is you save a removal spell. But with Jenga Taxis, you need to save like a couple removal spells. You need to not use any removal spells that game except to try and kill Jenga Taxis later. I think, you know, you're probably like trying to kill their mana rocks early. Yeah. You just can't let the thing land. Stop yeah. them from getting there. Kill the player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what that. Yeah. Well, there you go. So be be warned. I mean, it's a it's a very powerful card, but be warned. I think the word's already out on it. Very cool, yeah. All right, so the next card is we don't actually have the physical oh. copy of it because we didn't we didn't get this deck. Uh, it is Katsumasa, the animator. This is the mono blue legendary creature from the Azorius Buckle Up Vehicles Precon Commander uh -huh. Precon. Uh, we talked about it a little when we did the reveal video, and I think we haven't done the upgrade video yet. We are going to do the upgrade video. Uh, we usually just l allow a little time because it's weird to do the reveal video and then the next one is the upgrade video. So uh, that's coming. But we want to talk about Katsumasa on its own. Um, I'll read it. Katsumasa, the animator. Two blue blue for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature Moonfolk Artificer has flying. You can pay two and a blue, colon, so you can do this as many times as you've got two and a blue. Until end of turn, target non-creature artifact you control becomes an artifact creature and gains flying. If it's not a vehicle, it has base power and toughness 1-1 one, one until end of turn. Doesn't seem great. Turn, turns a... If it's a vehicle, it just gives it yeah. flying and sort of cruise it for two and a blue. It cruise it for freezies. Yeah. Well, it costs two and a blue. Yeah. But if it it's a, like a mana a rock... Crew cost. Yeah. But if it's a mana rock, it just turns it into a 1-1 one, one with flying. Right. But it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each of up to three target non-creature artifacts. Now... It's a little weird if you're not if you don't know the rule, but anything can carry a one one counter. It just doesn't matter unless it's a creature. In which case, then that will count towards its power and toughness. So you basically can like put counters on your non creature artifacts, and then eventually, when you do use the two and a blue ability, it, they'll become one ones. But oh, they've got three counters on it, so it's really a four four. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, Katsumasa is good with vehicles. It seems like the idea is that it's sort of made for vehicles in that sense. But then um, they realize probably there aren't that many vehicles and there are very few good ones. If it only works with vehicles, this isn't going to be all that viable. I mean, no one's going to build it yet. They're going to have to wait three, four, five years until enough vehicles have come along. And you don't really want to release a card that that's how it works. So, and of course, th there are some. There are some vehicles that are pretty good. Like Smuggler's Copter is, yep. uh, you know, a powerful little card that will just give you some, you know, card selection as you go through it. The the Omen Keel, Silent Submersible. Ooh, Silent Submersible. If you can put a grandma on that, <laughs> you're really going, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I think you want to get these vehicles out before Katsumasa comes out. So you want low CMC stuff because you really want to play Katsumasa on a Let's say you play it on turn four uh -huh. on curve. On turn five, you want to already have three non-creature artifacts in play and preferably yeah. vehicles if you could to take advantage of it. So I would even play like Consulate Dreadnought, which is a one mana seven eleven with crew six. Like it's not great, but at least I am getting the value off it. And then when I turn that thing into a flying vehicle for three mana, that's a little bit brutal. Yeah, you don't have to play you don't have to pay that crew six. Yeah. The crew six doesn't matter that much and it'll have flying. Yeah. The the big problem is you just really start running out of vehicles that are any good at all pretty quickly. So I think you are gonna have to decide after that point, like how do I want the rest of the deck to function? And I think there's a few ways to go. Once again, Cheerios could be really, really good. Sure. You want non creature artifacts because Ornithopter won't work, right? It's a creature. So Katsumasa does not interact with ornithopter in any way yeah but if you've got like bone saw claws of gix dark steel relic is actually a really good one because oh uh, yeah it, it's a, a zero mana just indestructible artifact it will retain the indestructibility that indestructible becomes very relevant when it's a creature attacking people so, so this will give you stuff that you can play and bone saw could still be an equipment that you equip to things until you're like okay i'm ready to pay the three mana to animate it and it's like, okay, I play this stuff, I play Katsumasa, and over two or three turns, it gets two or three counters on it. And of course, we're going to play with the counters and stuff as well, but that is a good way to sort of start getting... And, and actually, 
you know, no one's going to go kill your bone saw that has two one one counters on it, right? Like, there's better things to take care of. It is like a slightly, like, artifacts are not exactly untouchable or anything like that, but they're harder to destroy than creatures. So it is sort of like you have a board that you're saving up for when you want to actually animate them and turn it into the attack. And you're in blue, so you'll probably save a removal, or sorry, a counter spell or two for the Vandal Blast and the few things people do play that get rid of yeah. a lot. But for the most part, people don't play a lot of stuff that gets rid of all artifacts mm -hmm. you know maybe a pinpoint one or two but you're spreading this stuff around uh there are lands that are artifacts as well dark steel citadel indestructible also pretty good yeah you can put the counters on it that's a non-creature see to the synods another one which is just sort of like a free include yeah and i think the goal is when i play katsumasa i already have three non-creature artifacts out like you need to be getting it's already gonna be a little slow yeah so you need to be getting the three counters every single turn guaranteed I also think I think that there's kind of a way to build um, some of this into it, which is just like value artifacts, like stuff that will get you value when they enter the battlefield and will get you value when they exit the battlefield so that... Or, yeah, or as you turn it into a threat. Yeah, so if you do make it into even a 5-5 five, five or a 6-6 six, six, and you're throwing it at people, they've got to deal with it because you know, they want to block, they want to handle stuff, but if they do, you get stuff out of it. Like, I think Icker Wellspring is kind of an interesting idea here, which is just a two-mana artifact, and when Icker Wellspring enters the battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. Yep. So, that could just be something that when they block it, you get a card out of it. That's not bad. Insulates uh, you a little from the Vandal Blast and stuff, too. Yeah. Um, Microsynth Wellspring. I guess the Wellsprings are just kind of good for this, um, which is just a two-mana artifact. And when Microsynth Wellspring enters the battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So, again, kind of like hard draw? Yeah. It yeah. just is drawing you lands you want there. I like that. I was thinking this deck might be a lot of mana rocks. Yeah. Like, a lot. Uh -huh. Like, everyone you can find that's in any way reasonable. And all you're trying to do is just go, like, artifact, artifact, you know, just dump my whole hand, and it's got draw spells. And it's just like, okay, and once I have enough mana, then I just start using that mana to turn all these artifact or these mana rocks into creatures, which I've been putting counters on this whole time. Well, because eventually, if you've, like, really built out your board, you don't need all that mana in the same way that you did early. Yeah, you're like, and what am I going to cast with it? Nothing. I'm going to turn these into creatures now. Yeah. Yeah. So you're using mana rocks to cast more mana rocks and draw spells and stuff. And then when you have all these mana rocks, suddenly you kill people with it. Yeah, because they've been getting counters the whole time. Oh. I also think you could go with tokens. So obviously sure. there are clues, there are treasure, there are food. Uh, this is a way to make enough artifacts to then turn the tokens into creatures. So there's stuff like Ethereal Investigator, Confirm Suspicions, and Spell Swindle. This might be a spot for those two. Yep. Just, you know... They're not super efficient, but if I can get four or five artifacts out of it, now all of a sudden these are potentially creatures in a couple of turns. Well, it's easy to get a lot of them, which is just, like, good. And then I think once you've gotten a lot of artifacts out, you know, you don't have to rely on Katsumasa to be the one that's going to animate the stuff. And Rise and Shine. You know, you overlo overload a Rise and Shine, and uh, you've got a pretty serious board going on there. Yeah, March of the Machines, I guess, is more once you've gotten enough counters on all of them that it's going to, like... They're still saying, oh, you only have enough mana to animate two of them or so. Right. You go, nope, all of them. Um, yeah, so I think that could be really cool. And then, of course, speaking of counters, Blue's pretty good at playing around with counters. First off, Paradox Haze will make uh, you have two upkeeps and Katsumasa will trigger twice. As usual on an upkeep trigger, Paradox Haze is pretty good. Yep. You can Strionic, you can Lithoform Engine as well. Then proliferate's going to work really well here. So yeah. Lux Channeler seems amazing, right? Yeah. Because especially if you got like Cheers or something, you might hold a, a few of them in their hand, then go, you know, Play a zero-cost artifact, proliferate. Play a zero-cost artifact, proliferate. You know, you could get... It's, you know. it's kind of, not exactly, but it's like kind of a build-your-own-artifact Cathars Crusade kind right, of thing. Right, right. You keep playing these <laughs> artifacts and everything gets bigger. Yeah, so you could do some stuff like that. And then Sword of Truth and Justice is another proliferate on a sword, which seems quite good. Uh, and then all these blue commanders, and I think... This is something that I'm, I've been talking about more and more because it feels like most people don't realize it. But if your commander has a trigger, mm -hmm. you've got an automatic panharmonicon type effect for your commander if you're in blue. And you can always Sakashima. There's two Sakashimas now. They cost four. So you can always sort of double that trigger because they get around the legendary rule. So yep. whatever it is, your commander, if you're in blue, you know... You can always make another copy of it to get double those triggers. Sakashima is good a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, not not cheap cards. The old one's a little bit cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Sakashima the Imposter, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this, I, this, this seems like a fun deck. Not crazy powerful, but still going to be good. No, but it seems quite cool. good. Yeah. yeah. And Artifacts is always kind of just like fun to play with. All right. We've still got a few more. So uh, buckle up. This next one is quite strong. 
This is Kodama of the West Tree. And so this is a two and a green for a legendary creature spirit 3-3. Three, three. It has reach, um, which, you know, I probably would have forgotten. Uh, You're it, not blocking with it anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it has modified creatures you control, have trample. So that's pretty nice. Again, modified equipment, auras, uh, counters. And whenever a modified creature you control deals combat damage to a player, search your library for a basic land card, put it into the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. So, yeah, turns all your modified creatures into kind of sort of the animus, not on attack, on combat damage, but still. Go, I call this go wide modified. And remember that this is not it, when one or more of your modified creature each deals one. damage. It eats one. So if you have five, like even just you know, one ones that all have counters on them and you connect with all five of those, you get five lands. Into play tapped. Very strong. The easiest way to modify creatures is with plus one, plus one counters. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, like I said, this is a go-wide modified deck. So to maximize your modifications, you're going to want stuff like Renata, Call to the Hunt, which any creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional one, one counter on it. So she just makes things come in modified. Loyal Guardian, at the beginning of your of combat on your turn, if you control your commander, put a one, one counter on each creature you control. This is great because the same turn you play it, will put out the one, one counters onto stuff. Uh, Song of Freilis is one notch. Third chapter is put a one, one counter on each creature you control. Also gives them uh, Vigilance, Trample, and Indestructible Intel end of turn which is and nice too because it's a little bit of a ramp to kind of get you there the yeah it makes them tap for mana leading up mm -hmm. to it uh so i think that modifying your stuff is not going to be crazy crazy tough of course you can still modify with equipment and auras and i think you're not gonna you're gonna mostly want to do plus one counters but you can still do things like um bear umbra or sword yeah. of feast and famine uh that's a good way to go. And then, of course, the granddaddy of all powerhouses in this deck. Yeah, this card, this next card is nuts. The Avenger of Zendikar is doing everything the deck wants to do, right? So, already a really good card, but I think it just becomes bonkers good in this deck. Yeah, because you're already getting extra lands in play, so you're going to get a ton of extra plant tokens. But then when you play a land, it's going to put 1-1 one, one counters on all the plants. And when those plants hit somebody, because they have 1-1 one, one counters on them, they're going to put more lands in play, which is going to make the, all the other plants even bigger. I mean... In my experience, Avengers of Zendikar, the plants almost never connect. They almost <laughs> never swing. But if you do one time, it's over in this deck. Well, uh, not to mention if you get enough plants and just like one or two of them get through, like that's enough to make the ones that are still there just like keep getting bigger and bigger. If you can also tie the modification to landfall, so Retreat to Kazandu and Roaring Earth are both cards where when a land enters the battlefield under your control, you can put a 1-1 one -one counter on something. Uh -huh. That will sort of complete the loop yeah. where you're like, okay, it stuff hits, and then that's put lands into play, which puts counters on the stuff that doesn't already have counters, which so when that hits, that's going to, you know, yeah. complete the circle is now complete. And then you just have a feedback loop going on where, yeah. like, every turn that this is allowed to happen, it, things just get crazier. And then all you need to do is make it so that when lands come into play, I make creatures. Right. So that then when lands come to play, I put counters on those creatures and also. And there's plenty of stuff that does that. Yeah, so uh, Seed of the Land. Mm -hmm. Is Landfall make a 1-1? One, one. Scoot Swarm. Oh, boy. Yeah. If you didn't know, that card's good. <laughs> uh, Rampaging Baylos. And then, of course, there are the stuff that make mana when lands come into play, like Lotus Cobra. Tireless Provisioner. Oh, Tireless Provisioner seems so good in yeah. this deck. Because just make food or treasure probably making treasure every time a land comes in which will allow you to just cast more stuff i think this is a deck where amulet of vigor probably gets played that's true because you could potentially be getting you know a bunch of lands coming into play tapped and if all of them untap that's a lot of mana that you have left to spend on that turn so yeah, yeah that'd be really big so the and then of course the plus one plus one counter part of this is all like solved right hardened, um, hardened scales branching evolution evolution sage we won't go on and on but the mono green is well known for plus one plus one counter synergy yeah. so you're probably gonna have some amount of that in there although you don't need a ton you just need one modification to get the thing now obviously you want more to win the game with it or you know punch through make it hard to block but still you're mostly going to get a lot of land in a play and sort of win by overwhelming yeah. people that way the, the way i see it going is that you the ramp is more important to your eventual win condition than just having a million counters on everything. You'd rather get a lot of counters on a lot of stuff than, uh, or sorry, one counter on a lot of things. Than I feel a like lot you want to go really wide yeah. because you want to be able to go around their defenses with all the things you have instead of just trying to like, you know, go over it and stuff. That yeah, being you're said, like, whatever, I got six sapperlings, but they all got one, one counters on them. You're gonna block two of them, but I'm gonna get five lands. So that being attack. said, he does give those modified creatures trample. So if so, you have the big ones, that's a pretty consistent way to get through. That's a good point. That's mm -hmm. a good point. 
So Kodama of the West Tree, cool deck. Uh, not super complicated, I don't think. This next one's pretty complicated, though. Yeah. It is Kosei, Penitent Warlord. This is from the Upgrades Unleashed, the Gruel or Enchantment, or sorry, or Equipment uh, pre-con with Chishiro on the cover. Uh, Kosei is one green green for an 05 Ogre Samurai. As long as it's enchanted, equipped, and has a counter on it, Kosei has, whenever Kosei deals combat damage to an opponent, you draw that many cards and Kosei deals that much damage to each other opponent. Notice it said and, so you got to be mega modified. Right. You need to have all three, an aura, an equipment, and a counter on Kosei. If you jump through all those hoops, if you meet that condition, then your reward is when it deals combat damage, you draw that many cards. That means however much damage you did. Yeah. And then it will also deal that much damage to each other opponent. Note here, an important rules note is that Kosei's ability, that second ability where it deals damage to each other opponent is not commander damage. It's commander damage to the first opponent you hit, but the other damage is non-combat damage and it's just regular damage. So you can't just get him up to 21, hit once, and kill in the game. It doesn't work yeah. like that. Which is unfortunate uh, because it's an 05 and you got to jump through a lot of hoops. Yeah, because it, it's pretty important to make him bigger with those things that you're putting on him so that when he does connect, you're actually getting some good value out of it. So the condition of being aurad, equipped, and have a counter on it is actually quite difficult to meet. And we looked around and tried to see if there was a single card that would do all three things, and we could not find one. If there is one, let us know. We definitely want to know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's not, but maybe we missed something. There, You can meet two conditions with one card, and it's basically an aura that gives counters or an equipment that gives counters. There's, there's no... A, there's a couple that do, like, those different things. There's no aura that is an equipment or equipment that is an aura mm -hmm. that gives a counter. So that's where you kind of don't get all three. So aura plus counters, forced adaptation, Hydra's yep. growth, ordeal of Perforos. I think I think we mean uh, Oath of Nylea, actually. Oath of Perforos is, is the... Right, right. Uh, we meant to say ordeal of Nylea. Yeah, Perforos wouldn't make any sense. That would be red. Yeah. These are all, we'll give you two of the three. They still need equipment, though. Yeah. And then there are equipments that give counters. Armory of Aroas, Ring of Colonia, Sword, Sword of Truth, Truth and Justice, Justice does yeah. the proliferate thing, so it won't actually give you a counter. It'll sure, just but if keep you can put a counter on it, it'll keep making it bigger. And remember, you want to hit for a lot because you're going to draw the cards. So yeah. you, want, you do want to... This is the opposite of Kodama, where instead of modifying a bunch of things, you want to modify one thing a lot. Yeah, you want this to be a, a big boy who hits real hard and draws you a bunch of cards when you do it. Now, if you have double strike, you will double your triggers. Oh, that's true. That's cool. Which is quite cool. Yeah, so Fire Shrieker, Grappling Hook both give double strike. There are no green enchantments or auras that give double strike, but that could be a way to draw twice as many cards. Mm -hmm. Obviously deal twice as much damage. You can also Strionic and Lithothform Engine, the triggers. Um, so Which, it's a powerful enough trigger that it probably is worth it to do that. Like if you are hitting and even getting like three cards drawn from it, doubling it to six is a big game. Um, hopefully wish, you can get more than that. I wish they would have left enough room on Kosei so they could give him trample. I know. Because that part feels bad where I'm going to like do all this stuff. And if I haven't given him, I also kind of basically need to give him trample because they're going to throw anything in front of it. And the ability to throw just a small creature and stop the whole thing when I've had to jump through so many hoops to get there. I don't think he'd be broken with trample Not either. At all. <laughs> but I mean, I think they just couldn't fit it. But maybe they could just put the word Kosei, which is on there four times, on the card less somehow to make room for trample. I, you know. Just uh, make the font just a tiny bit smaller. They've done that for cards before, right? <laughs> I know. Have you ever seen a Planeswalker? The, t the, the, the type is way smaller than this. Oh, I, I mean, if you look at like... Uh, well, some of the ones we're coming to are just have so many types on their thing that their their font is tiny on their creature type line. Yeah, they easily could have fit Trample. I don't know. That would not have been broken. This yep. card already seems like not the card I want to play because I'm going to work so hard and somebody's going to be like, okay, yeah, path it. It's, it seems tough. It seems like the sort of commander you play when you like working for but, getting your strategy to... But also when you like disappointment. <laughs> yes. Because you're going to work really hard and then somebody's going to be like, okay, fine, kill the Swiftfoot Boots, you know, maze it or whatever. Yeah, I, I feel like what's going to happen a lot of the times is you'll be like, finally, I got it. Here's the aura. I play on it and they go... Pat In response, up. kill it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But you're going to draw like 18 cards and deal 18 dollars. I can't let that happen. Or even but worse. I've worked so hard. They put it all together and they're like, block with your 1-1. One, one. Yeah. Like, Duh, <laughs> come on. Where's my trample? All right, yep. uh, just a couple more to go here. Actually, four more to go. 
Okay, so up next. This one's cool, actually. It's yeah, a mono white commander neat. that I think is cool. Light Paws, Emperor's Voice. This is one in a white for a 2 2 legendary creature, Fox Advisor. Whenever an aura enters the battlefield under your control, if you cast it, you may search your library for an aura card with mana value less than or equal to that aura, and with a different name than each aura you control. Put that card into the battlefield, attached to Light Paws, Emperor's Voice, then shuffle. All right, so you cast an aura, and then you get to go find an aura, equal or lesser mana value, and put it on a Light Paws. Yeah. All right, so I think this is like aura toolbox. Yeah. And I think you think of auras only as Voltron cards, but they're not. They're, there's auras that do lots of different stuff. Well, obviously, you'll need the ones that go on Light Paws yeah. and can be kind of Voltron-y there. But you don't have to cast those auras to trigger the search. Right. You can try, like, a lot of curses, let's say, are auras. You cast yeah. that, trigger the search, search for an aura that goes on Light Paws. So the first thing I always think of with Mono White is, like, can I... Whatever I'm doing, can it generate enough card draw that this deck has a chance? And I actually think we might meet the threshold here because there are a lot of auras that draw cards. There's Angelic Gift, chosen by Heliod, Rune of Sustenance. There are actually 10 total auras that draw cards. And yes, they can trip, but actually, if you think about it, I cast an aura, I search my library for Angelic Gift, I put that on Light Paws, and I draw a card, and I've sort of gotten two cards there. Yeah. Because the Angelic Gift was also free. Yeah. So that actually, that amount of value, I mean... and That's pretty solid card advantage going on there. And Light Paws is a two... Uh, is a two drop yeah so it's you're doing this pretty early and i can see like this being a deck where i don't have problems where i'm running out of cards which is important for mono white and uh and in commander the the fact that it can't share a name with another r you have is is not a big deal they were clearly like listen we want this to be played in commander but don't break standard with it please come on uh there's also removal on auras so there's classic pacifism you know you put it on a creature a creature can't attack or block there's also dark steel mutation there's something like reprobation which is enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a coward with base power and toughness one i like how they just had to turn it into a coward like yeah. it's not enough to just give you make you an oh one and let make you lose your abilities we also have to brand you as a coward <laughs> I, I i love that, that, that there's no mechanical up like m coward doesn't do anything on its own there's there a couple other cards, cards yeah. that are like cowards cannot block warriors <laughs> right. but right now it's just like you coward <laughs> just I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig at you a little extra yeah. but it's important still, to note those are, are not the ones you can tutor up because when you tutor them up you do have to attach them to the light paws don't you don't want to do that so if you search for dark steel mutation you're just turning your uh light paws into a a beetle uh, maybe you would want to do it that's actually kind of it I loses all that. other abilities though oh well Dang it. yeah uh, yeah yeah okay all maybe right. if you had enough where like if you had we're gonna talk about some auras that like pump its power maybe you'd want to make it in a struggle i don't know anyway yeah you want to cast these and then go find the aura that goes on light, light paw yep um light paws there's also uh, returnable auras, which are pretty interesting. So white has a bunch of auras that you can pay mana and somehow give them back to your hand. So conviction, sun, sun clasp, clasp. Yeah. yeah, cage of hands. These are all auras that you they do something like conviction gives uh, enchanted creature plus one plus three, but you can pay a white mana to return to his owner's hand. So this becomes a you know, this is probably the first card I would go get, honestly. Yeah, like, Cage of Hands feels like... I mean, it's three mana, which is, like, more than a lot of the auras, and that's a good thing, because... Yeah, because you can go find more auras with it. You cast it, and you just keep finding the one and two mana auras that you are going to be putting onto Light Paws with it. Yeah, that's why I like Conviction, right? Cast a Pacifism on something. Mm -hmm. Go find Conviction, put it on Light Paws. Pay a white, get back to my hand, now cast it, allows me to go tutor for another aura, and I can do that all the time. So Seems really strong to me. Yeah, or at least pretty fun <laughs> it's fair strong not like yeah. ceh strong but cool it's white strong <laughs> uh, that made it worse <laughs> oh no and then of course there are voltron auras and these are the auras that just make the creature they go on which is probably going to be light paws a lot uh, you know more powerful so there's all that glitters which is you know one in a white for an enchant creature enchanted creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control and you're gonna have a lot of enchantments so and it counts the ones that are on other permanents and players. Yeah. It's just enchantments you control. As long as you control it. Yep. Spirit Mantle. Mantle of the Ancients is a cool one. You want to read that one? Oh, yeah. Mantle of the Ancients. So this is uh, three white white for an enchantment aura. And it's an enchant creature you control. When Mantle of the Ancients enters the battlefield, return any number of target aura and or enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to enchanted creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one for each aura and enchantment attached to it. 
this feels like it's a potential game ender when they're like, oh, I yeah. finally removed that thing and we feel safe. And you're like, play it. This sucks. Go. It gets back to your turn. And you're like, mantle the agements. Blah. Th- this has the the potential to be a real anime moment. Yeah. Where it's like, ha, I've gotten rid of all your stuff. You've got nothing now. And you're like, that's what you think. Boom. Boom. Mantle of the ancient. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then of course there's tons, the aura enchantment, you know, mono white deck has been around for a while. So there's a lot of support for auras enchantment. SRAM mm-hmm. lets you draw cards. Hero of Aroas makes them cost less. Sigard is aid, lets you cast them at instant speed. Yeah. We're not going to go through all this enchantresses in white. There, yeah. There's a ton. So I think actually this deck has, it has the stuff it needs to to, to get there, to to be like a real deck, I think. And because this is a two drop, I think it can actually do some cool stuff. Yeah, I agree. And I, I still think it could like win through the Voltron stuff. Like yeah. um, Light Paws is going to get pretty big, get pretty powerful and pretty protected and then, you know, fly in on people. But, but also a lot of the more pieces versatile. are removal and stuff. So they allow you more than a regular Voltron deck yeah. to still like remove key pieces and control things you need to and blunt, you know, what your opponents are doing. Which yeah, is, seems yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, seems pretty cool. I, I like this one. Um, all right. Three to go. The next one is Nashi, Moon Sage's Scion. Mm. One black black for a 3-2. Rat Ninja. Has ninjutsu for a three and a black. So if a creature is unblocked, you may return it. You may pay three and a black. Return it to its owner's hand and put Nashi from your hand into play, tapped and attacking that same opponent. Uh, Nashi also says whenever Nashi... Deals combat damage to a player. Exile the top card of each player's library. Until end of turn, you may play one of those cards. If you cast a spell this way, pay life equal to its mana value rather than paying its casting cost. I mean, anytime I hear that, I know that there's at least some power going on here. Yeah, life for mana. Like, we haven't learned our lesson with uh, Bullets of Citadel and other cards. That is oh, yeah. extraordinarily powerful. Turning your life... And it, and it actually scales into Commander very poorly as far as... Uh, well, depending on how you look at it, very well because we start with twice <laughs> right. as much life. So cards aren't really balanced for like people have like their CMC is not balanced for people have forty life. Um, I just want to say really quickly here. I, I tried to put a pin in it, but just in case you missed it, the ninjutsu part won't work if Nashi is in your command zone. There you, is an ability called Commander, Commander Ninjutsu, yeah. which this does not have. Eureka has that. Yep. I also wanted to say that a lot of people are calling this Ratavan because <laughs> it's a <laughs> I rat. Like that. Get it? <laughs> All right. So you're going to need to make Nashi unblockable and give it haste if you want it to be your commander. You won't be able to nin- ninja to it in. Otherwise, you'll have to do the Myojin thing where you like play it, bounce it to your hand, blah, blah, blah. That's not what you're doing. So, and, and it does trigger on combat damage. So it's going to have to get in there and actually deal the combat damage. So let's talk about everybody knows the Lightning Greaves and the Swift Foot Boots. We figured we'd mention some new ones Whisper Silk Cloak. Gives it Shroud and Unblockable. Uh, Chariot of Victory. This is a cool one. It's one to equip. It gives it First Strike, Trample, and Haste. So Tramples actually could be good because... Uh, if, if, if anything gets through, you still get that, that card off the top. Right, of, you don't of, have to hit him for the full amount. As long as one of his damage gets in, yeah. that counts. Uh, Fleet Feather Sandals, I think, is actually probably the best equipment... Because it gives haste and flying. Yeah, so then it just flies right over them. Yeah, hits so them, and then you get all the cards. It's a form of unblockability. Yeah. Um, so that's a way that you can, you know, play Radovan, get in there right away, and you can be tapped out when it hits because you're going to pay life to cast the cards. Yeah. Which is a big deal. And it also, it, it reveals the cards from everyone's, the top of Yours everyone's too. deck. So you'll get a selection of, in most games, four cards, which... And you can play them, right? It's not cast them. So you can get your land drop this way. Yes, it's play. Mm-hmm. So... You only get one of them. You could, Yeah. So of the four cards revealed, you get one. Or it could be more than four cards revealed. Well, I guess there's separate instances of four cards if you double strike it. Y- yeah. Or yeah. if you Lithoform Engine or Strionic Resonator it, you can do four cards, put those in a pile, and then four more cards, put those in a pile. That's if it's a four-player game, obviously. Um, but that will give you... That's quite powerful, but again, because in normal circumstances, you have to cast them. You're limited by the amount of mana you have. This is limited by the amount of life you have, which means you're definitely going to pick two of the cards and play them because you don't care. You're getting two cards into play for seven life, nine I mean, life. That whatever. means you could get some really big hits really early in the game. Uh, because it says each player, top deck manipulation could be good. Scroll yep. rack, sensei's top, crystal ball, same stuff we talked about earlier. So you can at least control the top of your library, probably at least put a land there or something. You could play a Mishra's Bobble and check someone else's library instead there you of go. yours. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to want some life gain, I think, in this deck. If you're going to be paying life 
to cast spells, which is extraordinarily powerful. You're going to want to sort of lean into that or offset it. Extort is a way that black has. Every time you cast a spell, you can pay a black mana, and then it basically drains everybody for one. Yeah, that's a great way to, you know, still be continuing to pay things, but... Uh, and winning the game through it. Yeah, you're basically uh, saying, I'm going to use my mana to gain some life, and I'm going to use the life to cast my spells, you yep. know, if you've got that going. Whip of Eros gives all your creatures lifelink. lifelink. Uh, Great Merchant of Asphodel is amazing. All usually, the time. like, you know, oh, I, I gain 20 life right now. Yep. Yeah, that's, that seems good. Also, d you know, deal seven damage to everybody or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, Nashi seems pretty cool. I think it is a on-combat damage trigger, so it's just naturally kind of held in check by that. It's going to be powerful, yeah. but anything that's like that is hard to just totally break in half. I think it's cool, though. And it's always fun to be able to cast a couple spells from your opponent's uh, decks, too, and, you know, mix things up. As Sheldon Minery likes to say, if, you, you know, if you're beating them with their own stuff, they di you did this to yourself. Like, yes, you can't get mad at me. If I, you know, find a Jin Gitaxius and you're... You can't get salty about it. You had Jin Gitaxius in your deck. That being said... They still probably will. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they never stopped anybody yeah. from getting salty. Uh, yeah, okay. next. We got two left. Up next is uh, Shigeki, uh, Jukai, yep. Jukai Visionary. Um, this is a 1-3, and this has a very long type line. It is a legendary enchantment creature snake druid. For one and a green. And it's for one and a green. And it also has the ability for one and a green and tap it. Return Shigeki, Jukai Visionary, to its owner's hand. Reveal the top four cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them into the battlefield tapped. Put the rest into your graveyard. And then it also has the ability channel XX green green discard Shigeki. That's all part of the cost. And then you return X target non legendary cards from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, so we should note rules note here you cannot channel Shigeki from the command zone. It has to be discarded from your hand. Right, which is in this case not the biggest thing because Shigeki does bounce himself to your hand with its first ability. Sure. So I think you can more reliably build around the ability to get to that. Yeah. Where you don't need another effect that's going to bounce it to your hand. So, you know, but you, yeah. And then once you channel it into your graveyard, uh, it's, a, it's changing zones at that point. You could put it into your command zone. So you can do all the normal things from there. It, uh, go ahead. It, it, it feels like the pattern of this is just like that you're most of the time using like a four mana get one land into the battlefield tapped, which is when you say that and it can whiff, it can whiff and it also can't happen the turn it comes out because that, so that doesn't have seem hate. great. It doesn't seem great, but I'll admit I kind of like it. Um, <laughs> one, because it is filling your graveyard as all this happens so that its channel ability mm -hmm. does become more powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. every time, worst case scenario, you have at least put four cards into your graveyard, which you can then channel back into your hand. Or three, yeah. Um, and then if you can find ways to lower the cost on that ability or, you It's know, so slow though. Four mana. So imagine, I play this on two. Uh-huh. On turn three. Yes. You then... It, on turn three, am I going... Bounce this in my hand, look at the top four, put a land into play tapped. Go? If you're playing Shigeki, yes, probably that is the plan. Uh, I think I'm still cultivating there. And then on turn four, maybe I'm going, do that, bounce it in my hand, find the land, then play it with my remaining mana. Still, it's... And then... Th because if I, I do that on turn three, then I got to play it the next turn and then wait another turn to activate it again. Uh, the, it, this still does something that I tend to really like in Commanders, which is turns a bunch of mana into a bunch more oh, mana. Man. <laughs> um, a true Commander it, player. Yes. And, and if you can find a way to like give it haste or something like that, then you could potentially, you know, once you have out a lot more things, just kind of keep doing that over and over again. Just put your whole deck into your graveyard. Uh, use all that mana you've had to pull back, you know, however many cards uh, that are your win condition and play those out and win the game. Yeah, and our first category here is reuse ability, mm -hmm. which four mana to get a land in play is not efficient. Nope. Can we make it efficient or palatable? And I think we can. You can reduce the cost of the activated ability with something like Hearthstone, which makes activated abilities cost one less. You can make the lands come into play untapped with Amulet of Vigor. That is a way to, you know... Then it's like paying for the cost a little bit. Yeah, so let's say the whole thing costs four, right? Refunds the cost. Hearthstone makes bit, it cost three. Yeah. Amulet of Vigor makes it cost three. Lotus Cobra, Tireless Provision, they make it cost three. Uh -huh. Extra Planar Lens makes it cost three. Uh, maybe even less. If you sure. have two lands, it might even make it cost two, actually. Emerald, Emerald Medallion. Emerald Medallion makes it cost one less because you're going to cast Shigeki, right? Yep. And then... Uh, 
Herald of the Pantheon makes your enchantments cost less. So that could make it so you could get this down to where it is very little mana to do well and if you can do this ability for like two two mana it's rampant growth kind of it's pretty good oh, it's, i think it's very good if you can get it down to two you need to give shigeki haste to really get into like starting to be broken territory not broken but so if you've got lightning greaves or thousand year elixir are kind of the two best ones because they both cost sure. zero yeah. thousand year elixir gives haste to any creature that has a tap ability and lightning Greaves attaches for zero there's always concordant crossroads but oh I'll tell boy. You experience it can, <laughs> risky. it can really backfire on risky, you <laughs> risky risky uh -huh. um you could do swift boots it'll make but you'll have to equip it each time you play it Which but is, but you could get into this pattern where it's like shigeki costs one to play and one to to uh, activate and then it bounces out back to his hand you get a land in a play comes in untapped you know, and you've if, got an extra player lens, you've got a a medallion out. Now you're like, oh, I can actually do this like seven, eight times this turn. Yeah, if you've gotten something set up where those lands are producing more than one mana, that could... Lotus Cobra, you could make it free. If you yep. get enough of these things out, it wouldn't be super crazy to be like, oh, I can do this as many times as I want this turn. Yeah. And then I'm just going to sell, I'm going to you know, do it 20 times and I'm going to mill 60 cards yeah, or whatever. You're dumping your whole deck into your graveyard, which if you can like really consistently get a lot of cards in your graveyard, this is just kind of like a tutor. Yeah. Like, and maybe you could even make this mana positive if you, if you were, you know, if you had Tireless Provisioner and Lotus Cobra and there's a blah, blah, lot blah. of ways to either double mana or get more out of your mana, like, you know, even Zendikar Resurgent type effects, things yep. like that. And, uh, but you're going to have to have a lot of pieces on the board to get that. Like this is a, you gotta work for it. Yeah. This is like a five, five card combo to get this going but it's yes. possible and i don't think we often say on the podcast you don't have to go infinite you can just go a lot so yeah. just getting the 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 full ability of you know reveal the four cards put a land into play if you get that down to cost only one or two mana then you can just do it like five to six times in a turn that's going to be pretty good uh-huh obviously you're casting shigeki a lot when you're doing that so enchantress support's going to be great this is a enchantment that bounces itself back to your hand so enchantress presence idol on a blossom success and champion so this could turn into card draw in the midst of all that and i kind of think even if you don't have a ton of other enchantments in the Still deck works, these are yeah. good because you're going to be wanting to cast this over and over and over again and you can also do you know self milly stuff to help you out shigeki yep. doesn't have to be the only thing milling you so hermit druid jimmy's favorite could be really really good uh world shaper seems great because it'll actually get like a bunch of lands in play also uh, -huh. uh golgori grave troll it's dredge that's a way you know if you have especially if you have like enchantress or something sure. out, green is actually quite good at self mill and then of course graveyard recursion shigeki does it but you'll probably want another piece of graveyard recursion to get back with shigeki so shigeki gets like let's say i don't know xx Green, green. So let's say you've got enough mana and you're going to get four things back sure. from your graveyard. Which shouldn't be that hard because you've been ramping with Shigeki the whole right. time. Right. And Shigeki's going to go into your graveyard, though, with that. So if one of the things you get back is an, a regrowth uh -huh. and then three other cards you need, now the regrowth can, can get the, the Shigeki going. back for you. No, I now, feel like the first time you can just let him go to your command zone and be like, ah, he costs four, four now. Yeah, it'll be okay. But like, you don't want to keep doing that. That's My not guess is, though, you're there's not going to be a, a second time a lot of times. Yes. You're going to be like, I milled 50 cards into there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get the th cards I need. And then maybe I don't even care if Shigeki just sits in there the rest of the game because I already got to the point where I have 25 lands in play or whatever. Well, and I mean, besides those graveyard recursion things, getting Shigeki back, Shigeki's filling your graveyard. So if you don't feel like using Shigeki's channel thing yet, it's still like, you know, an eternal witness can get you yeah. back whatever that key card that's been put into there is. Yeah, or that, yeah, perfect removal spell at the right time or whatever too. Yeah, so I think this deck is going to be sh look really strong when it looks strong. Yeah. Because it'll be like, holy crap, you got to get every land out of your deck. But it's like, yeah... They needed three, they needed an artifact, a specific enchantment, and this other thing for that to really work. So it feels like a pretty different green strategy to me, though, yeah. with the with the just how much the mill and recurring all that stuff kind of works into it. I do like tap abilities on creatures. <laughs> it is cool. All right. We got one more to go. This is our last one. It's a weird one. Certainly odd. It is the reality chip. One and a blue for a zero four. It is a legendary artifact creature equipment jellyfish. <laughs> what what these type lines have come to, right? It says you may look at the top card of your library anytime. So you can look at it at any time. As long as the reality chip is attached to a creature, you may play lands and cast spells from the top of your library. And it has reconfigure 
two and a blue. Jordan, can you read what the reminder text for what reconfigure is? So reconfigure for whatever its cost is, uh, lets you attach target creature you control or unattach from a creature. Reconfigure only as a sorcery, and while attached, this isn't a creature. So basically it lets you turn it into or away from an equipment. Right, and when it's not, it's kind of like bestow, but for equipment. Yeah. There's some rules intricacies here about how it works with cards that refer to equipping or, because there is no equip cost, there's a reconfigure cost. Mm -hmm. So creature with a reconfigure card equipped to it is technically equipped. It's a little bit weird. We won't get into all that here because it doesn't matter much for this deck. Basically, you can attach this to a creature for two and a blue. And once it's attached, you get access to this ability of as long as the reality chip is attached to a creature, you may play lands and cast spells from the top of your library. That's the part we're going to um, talk about. But you should look up reconfigure rules because they are a little more complex than you would think. Uh, this is basically Future Sight, right? Yeah, the Future Sight, the card. It's a notorious card where you can look at the top card of your library and play those spells. I think people think of this as... If they haven't seen it in action with Bulls of Citadel and other things like that, this type of effect, they think of it as like, oh, I might get an extra card off of it. But actually, this could draw you three, four, five, six extra cards, just depending. Yeah, if, if you get lucky and you hit a bunch of cantrips on top, especially, you I don't, don't know. You don't need cantrips, you just need spells. Well, that's true. Because you I, play the spell and now there's a new card on top. What what you don't want to have happen is you hit multiple lands. Right. Because it doesn't give you actual land drops. But if, if you hit something that has a lot of low mana value kind of thing, yeah. you can just keep chaining it together. You can just keep it going. Yeah, and that uh, allows you to play you could get, yeah, like you said, five, six cards off of it. Right, exactly. Yeah, this is very powerful. Obviously, we keep talking about this but top deck manipulation is what you'll need here. Uh, Sensei's Divining Top, Scroll Rack, Brainstorm, you also, because that allows you to like set what's there, get uh -huh. past the lands, move the lands. Like since the divine top's really good because you're like anything you, that lets you scry is just great. Yep, yeah, scry is great. You can all, all, you can also run Milliken and deranged assistant stuff like that, uh -huh. which lets you mill the top card of your library. So you go until you hit a land. You've already maybe played your land for. Two. Eh, I don't want that one. Well, yeah, Ooh. it's stopping me right because I played my land. I can't play that card and I can't see what's under it. So you go, oh, Milliken. Yep mill it away and now i look at the next card fetch lands also good uh -huh. they allow you to shuffle your library look at a new top card there's also some combo synergy with this card and again this generally is known because of elsha of the infinite and future sight and yeah. things like that bull is a citadel since he's divining top is like very important to a deck like this and a very expensive card we know yeah uh, but it will change the power of this deck by quite a bit especially enormously since, especially since blue is good at finding artifacts and this is probably gonna be the artifact that you're gonna find so here's how um some combo synergy stuff i guess we'll talk about synergy first sage of beyond which is five blue blue for a five five flyer but it says spells you cast from anywhere other than your hand cost two less to cast so that will all the stuff you're casting off your library and it has foretell for four and a blue so you can get it out for cheaper yeah and then uh, it just makes everything on top of your deck cheaper, yeah. real powerful. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to be mean, you can play Knowledge Pool. Knowledge Pool is an artifact for six, uh, which has imprint. When Knowledge Pool enters the battlefield, each player exiles the top three cards of his or her library. And then it has, whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand, that player exiles it. If the player does, he or she may cast another non-land card exiled with Knowledge Pool without paying the card's mana cost. So you're not casting stuff from your hand. You're casting it from the top of your library. So Knowledge Pool doesn't do anything for those spells. Mm -hmm. But everybody else, every time they cast a spell, that's not the spell they're actually casting. They have to cast something else from in there. And what that tends to do is just kind of make it hard to do anything. Obviously, if somebody casts a removal spell, then the next person casts not a removal. They can cast a removal spell that the first person tried to cast, but it's just hard to do. Yeah. And so it's it becomes pretty like oppressive knowledge pool is often just played and it stops anybody from doing anything except the person that played knowledge pool. Uh, of course you can play with Teferi and things like that to just sure. absolutely lock people out. If you oh, yeah. really mean, uh, and then of course there's the classic future site combo. Uh, I actually did the Elsha of the infinite, the spike feeders did a, a quick video about that combo and I was the voice of it. Nice. Um, so Sensei's divining top with a, with a card that lets you play the top card of your library can lets you draw your entire deck if you just have one card that allows you to reduce the cost of your artifacts. So Foundry Inspector, Ethereum Sculptor, there are a few others. This would make casting Sensei's Divining Top free, right? Because it's a one drop. And then you activate its ability to draw a card. So what you do is you look at the top card of your library, you activate the ability to draw the card. Sensei's Top goes on top of your library. You drew the card that was there. Now you say, oh, because of Reality Chip, I can cast this card. And because of Ethereum Sculptor, 
it costs nothing. I cast it. Then I activate, drop the top card, do that again, draw your entire deck. And then you usually end up winning with Thassa's Oracle. There it is. Or la- in the old days, Lab Jace Maniac and, and Lab Jace, Maniac. Yeah. yeah, but nobody does that anymore. They just Thassa's because Oracle and win that way. Because you may as well win the trigger better. on the stack. Yeah. yeah. So that is um, a boring ending to... The- you don't have to build the deck that way, right? You could yeah. just build with future site value. Um, but that that is a combo potential that the deck certainly will have. And because it's on your commander and Blue's good at finding artifacts, I think that that version of the deck will be very powerful. Now, I I do kind of think one thing that's going to hinder the power of this deck a little bit is that it does need to be equipped. It needs to be attached to actually be able to have that ability. Otherwise, it just has the very powerful ability of being able to look at your top <laughs> the you top card look. of your deck every turn. Yeah. You could look, but you can't do anything with it. Um, <laughs> so I guess if you're building this, you are probably going to want to make sure you have enough creatures and stuff in it that you can consistently have something out to attach it to. Yeah, um, but your Derange Assistants, your Foundry Inspectors, yeah. your Ethereum Sculptors can do that. So They're I there. don't think it'll be have it'll be too tough of a time. But it does, like, someone can stop this online yeah, combo. that's a good point. You go, um, okay, I activate to draw the top card, and they go, okay, in response... I'm going to destroy the creature that reality ship is uh, attached to. And if that's your right. only creature, you, that could stop you dead in your tracks right there, for sure. Yep. You're in blue, though. Yeah. You just go counterspell. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> stop them. You have that power. You go fierce guardianship, probably. It yeah, seems like that's People true. have that all the time now. You're right. Okay. Uh, we, that is going to do it. We have gone through all the monocolored commanders. That was a pretty long episode. Really quickly to wrap up here, Jordan, let's talk about what we think is the most powerful new monocolored commander from the set. I think there are two to choose from, and they're both mono blue. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, I think the obvious one, the one that's super, super obvious, is Jinkataxis. Yeah. Which I think is very powerful and could be the most powerful. That's what I put down. But it is seven mana. Uh huh. So I could see Reality Chip being the one that's more powerful, just because it's a little easier. You're going to go off a little earlier if you if we built full CHH combo versions of these. Maybe it's Reality Chip. I don't so know. You you think Reality Chip is is the other most powerful one there? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I I'm a little iffy on that just because I think it is going to be pretty removable. Um, just having to put the thing on it, but I, I could really see it like ending up being pretty top tier like that. Uh, the, the other thought I had for one that I think will be really powerful, I mean, I think Jenga Taxis is yeah. far and above the most powerful, but I think Kodama of the West Tree is going to be um, surprisingly powerful. If you can get those modified creatures well, I think that it's going to often be one where one solid hit that like gets you a big ramp of mana is going to give you such an advantage that it's going to be hard for people to come back. And Mono Green it. is very strong. Yeah. Okay, well... We always like to also ask what our favorite new monocolored commander is, because often we are not drawn to what is the most powerful. Um, mine, I'm a little surprised by, but I'm light pause. I'm actually I, kind of excited about it. as I as we were listing this out, and I was like, that sounds cool. And I don't have a mono white deck because spoiler alert, white sucks. <laughs> it's uh, tough. so I think I might build that deck. I'm looking forward to it, and it'd be nice to have a mono white deck in my repertoire. Yeah, I think Light Paul seems super cool. Yeah. Like, it, it's one that just, it hasn't been done quite like that before. Yeah. You know, it, and I get to have a bunch of low CMC stuff, so I don't feel like, yeah. you know, you, I'm not doing much. I feel like you can do a lot with that deck. You will make a lot of plays, which often White feels like, at, you know, pretty early in the game at some point, I stopped being able to do much because I didn't have enough card draw or, you know, so it's like whatever I did by turn five, after that, my options just become very limited, which that deck feels like it won't be like that. I hope. Yeah. How about you? Favorite card? My favorite one, uh, and I was I was really torn here because there were two of them I really liked, but uh, despite me just saying that I don't think it's like all that top tier powerful, I'm pretty excited about the reality chip. I, I, I think that seems like a fun way to do kind of a mono blue thing. And even if you're not turning it into this like crazy combo right. thing, it's just like that future sight on a stick is is a powerful little ability there. Um, what was the second one? My second one is uh, is Shigeki, the yeah. Chukai Visionary. Cause That's I, my second one, too. I think it's just really cool. It's it's a neat card. I and like tap abilities and just the the complexity of trying to be like, okay, can I just activate... How can, can I build a Rube Goldberg, Rube Goldberg machine that lets me activate that first ability like 10 times? If you could get it there. If you can get it to the point where you're like, Shigeki, bounce, Shigeki, bounce, Shigeki, yeah. bounce. I just think that would feel so cool. <laughs> Even though at the end of it, you're like, what happened? Well, I put 20 <laughs> cards in my graveyard and my commander's in my hand and I got seven lands into play. Go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Pat myself on the back. 
<laughs> worth it. Worth it. I'm going home happy. <laughs> All right. To the listeners, what new commander are you the most excited to build around from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty? What sweet tech do you think we didn't talk about or we missed on this episode? Please tell us in the comments below, on Twitter, on our Discord if you're a patron. And then, of course, if you want to get your hands on these cards, you can pre-order everything right now at channelfireball.com slash command. You can pre-order them as singles. You can pre-order them as collector's boosters or set boosters or bundles or whatever you want. The marketplace really is the best place to buy sealed product uh, because all of the vendors on there are licensed professionals, LGSs. So they're all going through the WPN, through the distributor. They have really good prices on their sealed stuff. So if you're looking for boxes and things, you know, if you're going to draft, we love to draft here at the command zone. This seems like a great set to like pick up some sealed stuff too. Yeah, There's we did it. So much cool stuff. In this yeah, set. we got to do a draft because we had a couple boxes for game nights uh, here with yeah. the staff here and it's a super fun draft format. So it's a blast. Yeah, if you want to pick stuff up, channel fireball.com slash command and then of course once you get that stuff there are really cool versions of cards in this if you get the neon ink version of the hitetsugu especially like, if you get like the red one oh it's gonna be crazy rare yeah i don't don't quote me on these numbers but i think i was reading it's like one in 200 boxes has i heard a, something a like red that. neon ink so like if you get that you don't want it to get damaged so you need to use ultra pro products to protect all of your game pieces they make eclipse sleeves they make satin tower deck boxes mythic collection they make the best play mats they make all kinds of stuff just to go in your game game room wall scrolls they make sweet new eclipse dice which we really like uh, for our gameplay videos oh yeah uh, really nice yeah now that people are playing on spell table and stuff those dice are really clear they're really good on camera so i would highly recommend all ultra pro stuff they really do make the best accessories to protect your game pieces all right we are going to skip the end step because this is an it's extremely very long. long episode we'll be back soon jordan I'll, I'll bring you on again so you can talk about end step i know you know about a lot of cool stuff uh before we go big thanks to our amazing team here at the command zone Arthur Meadowcraft, Shauna Gillis, Damon Lenz, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Gaurav Galati, Jamie Block, Evan Limberger, Mitch Trafford. I got to also thank Jimmy Wong. And of course, big thanks to Truck Ty, my assistant, for helping us with a lot of the research for these episodes. These episodes take hours and hours and hours of research to put together to make sure that we're covering all our bases. Yeah, Truck uh, puts a lot of good work in there. Yeah, Truck does a lot for us. And of course, big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the Living Card Animations that begin and or just begin the episodes of our show and often sit be behind us here in the windows on set although this cyclonic rift was done by sam you can find jeffrey palmer uh, on twitter at living cards mtg okay Whew. my voice is tired and uh it is about lunchtime we should go eat all right thanks everybody we'll see you next time peace For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>